morning and welcome to Sunrise. I am Alero Edu. Good morning. I'm Ayo Makinde. Welcome to the program. Um, where's your cup of cocoa? Um, I had oh, you... some cocoa, cocoa earlier. Are you sure? Yes. Is it black or white? Because, you know, cocoa is white. This is why you missed him last week, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> you missed my very mad partner. Uh, oh, well. well. He's here today. And he's already started his, you know what. But you know, that mad comment is actually quite suited. Well... Yeah, because, I mean, the press... There are those who would say mad means make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> but remember, when we were young in broadcasting, you don't have to be mad to work here, but it helps. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I think it's for every creative... Uh, everyone in the creative industry. Yes, it is. But it I don't is, know how creative is. you want to get in governance. When the former president of Basanjo said we oh. need, <laughs> it requires madness to rule Nigeria. But it's it, it's seeming as if the former president has a point. <laughs> what do you say? Well, I think he himself may have had a tiny bit of it. Well, <laughs> therefore, he should know. He should know. <laughs> because I mean, I mean, look at you know some of the decisions. There are those who are still talking about the OD uh, event. For yes. Say, well, it had to take a bit of <coughs> for, for that to happen. Just I didn't say anything. I'm just a bit know. of um, cocoa. No. How did you describe? Please. Um, M A D is an acronym for making a difference. Making. Okay, yes. yes. Okay. A bit of making a difference. Yeah. Okay. You know, so that that. But then, so you know, he leveled OD to make a difference. Well, I don't know how much difference. <laughs> I don't know how much difference that was. But you know, I think he may have been referencing what happened in Ghana. You know, the Jerry Rollins, Rollins yeah. uh, time. And I think it was such a thing as Thomas Ankara as well. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. then don't also forget that that's the kind Sankara. of thing we had in Isn't Rwanda. That, uh, Burkina Faso? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So don't forget that's also the kind of thing we had in uh, Rwanda. So I, I'm just wondering okay. Uh, okay. if that's the kind of uh, the kind of mad, you know, that is required, you know, here. Because um, if okay, we have a benevolent dictator, so he, he's described in 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 Rwanda, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know how the word benevolent and dictator. Um, um Ayo. I have been to Rwanda and I see the magic that the benevolent dictator is, the magic that he's doing in, um, in his country. Mm. And I, I, I think that Nigeria could do with a benevolent dictator of that nature because he has transformed his country. Mm. 20 years of genocide and all that, and they are experiencing so much peace. They are experiencing development. And I remember that when I returned from my visit to Rwanda, uh, I said on this program that what struck me the most was I did not see a single sheet of paper in any part of Rwanda, that, uh, Kigali, that I visited. On the streets? Not a piece of paper. And about two weeks ago, there was some video making the rounds about how the Kagame was just taking a walk in Kigali. I mean, which of our presidents can take a walk in any city in Nigeria and feel safe? Mm. And of course, it's all, it's all it's this political thing that, okay, did the people really want you? Mm. Are you really popular with the people? If you were, you should be able to take a walk around. Remember that Paraguayan president who drives his little Vokes mm. and lives in his little village? Mm. Quite, there are quite a few. I think it was, you a, know. was it an Argentine president as well who said, look, I don't want my picture in your homes. I but want the picture of your, your children. children. So you know that those are the people you are working for, not me. Don't idolize me, idolize them. Anyway, that's for the mad. <laughs> um, it's just, I, I just found that interesting. And I think it's something worth discussing. Because we have had quite a trip in this country, and there are those who are still wondering how long, how further down the road do we need to travel before we get it right? There are those who are still oh. asking the vision question. If we have leadership... Well, no, that's a vision question. Yeah, if, if All we have, over again. If, if we have leadership, 
what there should be a vision where are they taking us and what is the timeline for this place we're going to how long is it going to take us to get there nobody's talking about all that well let's hope we'll be able to take that on with uh, those who will we will el el this, uh, the aspirants with the, with the, you know. <laughs> and then talking about mad decisions, what, would you consider it a mad decision that Lagos took, banning Okada? Nope. You were not here last Saturday. It was like they were reading my mind because only last Saturday <laughs> on this program I said, there used to be a law in Lagos State banning there Okada. Is. Well, I used the word <laughs> used to be last week that banned them from major roads and highways and bridges in the state. So what is happening? Nobody is enforcing it. So these people have taken over every single road, every bridge, every highway. And what's more? They are riding against traffic and telling you to please give them way. They're shooing you away from the road. Come on. Well, I mean, we have fallen so deeply into this rot hmm. that we all now actually have accepted it. And we actually move away for them to go by. Uh, because you don't want... You don't want trouble. You don't want trouble. You don't want any lynching and all of that. One of things. them hits you and you are the one who's going to get it's lynched. Guilty. Yes. You know. it's, and let, let's just hope that this time it's for real because... Um, and as it's I quoted, got to be. I, I quoted, you know, earlier on, I mean, in the course of the week, the Tinubu government banned Okada, mm. maybe restricted their movement for a bit. I think mm. it was in 2006. The Fashola, Fashola. government did the same, yeah. you know, restricted them in some ways. And the there was some Ambo sanity. Yes, the Ambode government did the same. And now the um, Sawalu government twice. No, remember it was um, a combination of end SARS and COVID. That kind of stepped in. Yes. Down. But yes. it started in 2006. Well, it's time to enforce 100%. The police has said they're going to enforce. And one of the questions we asked the police commissioner, <laughs> you saw it. <laughs> I saw that video of them shooting and running. Okay. So Do they have the wherewithal to we enforce? We asked that question. Because those boys are dangerous. Especially because at the end of the day, it's, it's those a whole, boys it's a, are it's dangerous. A, it's a whole lot. It's a whole lot. So, is well, they don't pay taxes. They don't pay rents to anybody because they live anywhere. They defecate anywhere because they don't have homes. So, what exactly is their economic value to Lagos State? Well, I'm I'm almost certain that uh, the Lagos State government has had quite some feedback. Because when the Commissioner for Information was talking yesterday, he said, look, people got back to them a lot. And said they didn't want them in their neighborhoods. Exactly. <laughs> and if, from what I understand, of course, you know, you people also had a press conference, you Lekians. Which you people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, had a, a press conference and said, enough is enough. Enough is so, enough. Um, so that is, is that because it was, it was just one death too many, unnecessary, forgot. Uh, what's the, it's like asking the question, what's the price naira. Of, a, uh, of, a, of a human being? 100 naira. Come on. Even if it's a million, would it be enough? To imagine that someone who is on the throes of death because of an illness and we are trying to raise like, maybe 5 million or so for that person. I mean, I don't know. So, so. And it's interesting to note that Lagos State is actually enforcing it already. Oh. Even though they gave June 1st as the date of enforcement, because yesterday they said they had uh, impounded 235 motorbikes or something. Yeah, they, you know? what the commissioner said was there is a law yes. that restricted their movement on major highways. Full stop. But there are major highways and bridges. Mm. That law is still standing. Yeah. But in the local governments that the governor mentioned, okay. they are not to be seen at all. From June 1st? No. The, the, yes, from, from, from June the 1st. Mm -hmm. They're not to be seen at all. So all the clamping down, all the arresting and mm -hmm. everything, the mm -hmm. impounding that you're seeing, they are the enforcement of the Lagos State Traffic Law. Okay. So that law that you talked about, mm -hmm. it's a 2018 law, so... It's still sub it's subsisting? Still yeah. But I hope that all these boys understand the language that Lagos State is speaking. Because obviously, from the tone 
of the government, from the governor, the mm. day that he was making this pronouncement, I could see anger, I could see frustration. It was like, enough. I enough. have had enough. One thing that I, I don't, we weren't able to bring this up to, you know, you know with the governor because we had so many issues to bring up with, with uh, Mr. Commissioner. Mm. But I, I always believe in the need to engage, you know, um, not that you're going to count out to them, mm. but let there be some form of engagement. Look, this we need to do this and we need to do it right. Let the people themselves understand what's at play here. So we don't want to see uh, uh, tricycles, we don't want to see motorbikes um, anywhere in the city of Lagos. The question they themselves would be asking, I mean, let's just be fair, is look, this is their livelihood. Mm. It's just a, the Yorubas say, that now only one sleeve, they make you abuse 200 sleeves. Uh, it is also the means of livelihood. How much tax are they paying out of it? That's where the engagement should have happened. Because mm. some people mm. collect dues and duties and levies from, from them. them. And I recall when Fashola was um, uh, governor, this uh, very famous story about Okada riders actually asking Please, where is the tax office in this area? I want to go and pay my tax. You see? Because I can see what he's doing with the money. And I don't know if that, I hope and wish that can come back so that people can at least, you know. Wish, so wish. that engagement is. Wish, wish. <laughs> come on. Wish, wish. Well, another wish is that the NRC, the rail line, will resume work in, along the Abuja Kaduna uh, axis, but that has been put on hold now. For obvious reasons, because uh, those affected by that kidnapping are saying that it, um, they didn't think that it was right, that their relations were still in captivity, and um, it didn't seem to them that government was doing enough to get them out of captivity, mm. and government had the effrontery to say, okay, the train service is going to resume. Well, yeah, um, there are three modes of transportation into i mean i had to check the map again just to be sure that abuja is not so far from kiduna they say it's their border states mm -hmm. so to speak they are border territories mm -hmm. abuja has a border with kiduna so mm -hmm. it's you move from kiduna into abuja not that you go from kiduna into katsina or into any other state into, before you get to uh, so it's a straight route so and there are three modes of transportation air road and rail. Mm -hmm. The three have been uh, at risk over the past few weeks or months that we have had to. So government has its job cut out for it. Um, the, the, the roads, of course, we know all of the issues with the roads and everything. Mm -hmm. I think it was even along the course of the week that yes. the, the governor has said, look, can we just clear the road? Because <laughs> I remember the Lagos Ibadan axis many years ago, there were no houses on the left and on the right. Well, that's like talk, talking about Lagos and Shagamu, which have now merged into one city, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I was in University of Ibadan, you traveled to, through Shagamu and you would not see anything right or left as you, go, you know, went mm. towards Shagamu. But mm. now, it's like, it's one town. Mm. It's almost one town all the way to Ibadan. Well, it's cheering that at least government has said, okay, we're going to put it on hold for now, the, the resumption. <laughs> And a part of what they said was uh, to all to collaborate and cooperate with the federal government in its uncompromising mandate of protecting the territorial integrity and internal security of Nigeria. A number of things. Of course, the information is on channelstv.com if you mm. want to catch up on the reason for the shift. But um, it'll be it'll be it is sensitive of uh, the NRC to have done that. But the questions you want to ask then is. Don't forget, we made so much. There was so much investment going into that. The Abuja, Abuja Kaduna yes. you know, Rail. And um, I think there are still loans hanging on it, almost too. Almost certainly. Those yeah. are still there. Yeah, in dollars. <laughs> <laughs> we know. <laughs> no, no, no. no. I, just had, I just had to underline it's that. Not in yen. You know. Don't worry, we know. Plenty money. Plenty money. <laughs> you know, so. We owe plenty money there, so we need to make money to start paying back our loans. So that is also there, but this hmm. was the value of human life it goes back to that. Yeah. You know, what is the value of human life? And there are many of these uh, security uh, agents who say, look, we know what the problem is. We know where these guys are. 
The question then is, if we know, I've always expressed my confidence doing? The courts in are Nigerians. waiting. Mm. What, what, if we know mm. where they are, can we just pick them up? What are we waiting for? And just end this? Abby? But, mm. you know, I'm not in security, so maybe I don't know what the issues are. Mm. Mm. So, um, so oh. is it breakfast oh. time? Um, just before we go to the menu, mm -hmm. regarding these Okada people, we were hearing rumours that some people were going to beg government, that uh, saying that these were these people's means of livelihoods, so they should let them continue. But it's, I think it's also apt for us to add that if the state is going to um, limit the movement of these alternative transportation means, then the state should be up to the task of providing adequate transportation for the people of Lagos State. 20, 20 million odd of us live here, and we need to move from one place to another. Well, you know, the, um, one of the issues we raised that everyone has you know, talked about is, look, those are the last mile uh, means of livelihood, of transportation for people. Mm, mm. You get off the bus at, say, uh, is it Osaka bus stop or what, whatever it is, and then you have to take a bike to get to your house. You understand? But what's so, wrong with walking? When you get on the bus in, in, in London and you get off the bus, do you take uh, anything from there to your house? Darling. Don't you walk? Darling. Okay, there are walkways. That's London. Okay, there are walkways. It's, it's not Osaka, London. Wait, so it's Osaka, London. <laughs> So, government also talk, talked about, uh, you know, last mile buses and all. I haven't seen them, maybe because my, my area is sophisticated, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we have them in Ajegule, Ajeromi Felodu, and mm -hmm. all those areas, I don't and know. guess what? When I was a young lady, well, in my teenagers in, in Nigeria, and we heard about motorbikes being used as modes of transportation in Cross River State, in Calabar. I mean, the mind boggled because you tried to imagine a motorbike as a means of transportation and the picture just didn't sit right with you. You just couldn't accept it because you lived in Lagos. I was in Calabar where? Yes, at the time. Calabar was the capital. At some point, yes. So it still is. There was a, a capital of Nigeria at some point, so uh, you can imagine the economic activities and ingenuity that could have arisen at the time. Maybe that was it. I don't know. Ingenuity. <laughs> but don't forget that <laughs> it's not only in Lagos that you now have Okada. They're everywhere. Uh, Chaba in some other parts. Yes, and they're other everywhere. So, I and guess uh, it, it, it's just so. How did we get to this pass? where we are using motorbikes as a mode of transportation. Well, we got there gradually when you know, unemployment rose How so did high. we get here? And I think there are, uh, there are other parts of the world that they have it, only it's a lot more sophisticated. Motorbikes? Yes, maybe not as... I've traveled quite a bit and maybe I don't not think the I've way seen we have it now. We've yes, Kekemarua, yes, <laughs> but not motorbikes. I've, I've heard, of, of, and I think I even saw, mm. you know, I'm maybe not thinking. in the way we do it. It would be very, very still sophisticated. Thinking. Okay, you're scanning? Yes, I'm scanning. <laughs> I don't think I saw it anywhere else. <laughs> uh, maybe in I heard about Benin it. Republic. I may have, no, it was even in the West. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. All right. So we we'll leave the motorbikes alone and go to our menu now. Um, political economy is where we take off today. We're going to be looking at delegates' votes. An, uh -huh. an extremely important element mm -hmm. that we have ignored for so long in mm. our electioneering. And then we'll be talking about the International Day of Biodiversity as well. Mm, Check out what that means. What is biodiversity? Okay. Bio is true. Diversity, plenty. So, don't, don't, It don't. is two and it is plenty. Please, we'll get there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pacelli School of the Blind is 60. Wow. Okay, something to celebrate. And then we're going to have the artist of the week. A he, a she, or a shim? I don't know. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, let's, let's say shim. A shim. Mm. Um, I'm not sure of that gender <laughs> or uh, <laughs> in Nigeria. I'm not sure of it yet. But I guess we'll get to that. Uh, we'll cross that river when we get there. So, um, I don't know what
tickles you this morning? Is it coco, coco, or um, what again? Honu? Oh. Why are you looking at me like that? Go on, go on, go on, <laughs> go on. Grab a cup of something. I am uh, urging you on. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back with the first topic. <laughs> Ahead of the presidential primaries, aspirants have begun to seek the support of their delegates as well as canvas for votes. <laughs> I tell you something, I, uh, I wouldn't mind being a delegate right now because I've heard all kinds of, uh, it's, you know, perks. You know, we hear that term, political economy. Ah. We only focus on the political part of it. You see that economy? That is the major thing. <laughs> as they say, that is the cocoa. Cocoa of the matter. So we even heard the vice president promising delegates free accommodation, not free true. food. It's not true. It's not the true. presidency, well, the, his office has since rebuffed it. Ah, I said okay. it didn't, that is not true. Okay. But we know that this happens. Oh, well, if you want me to come and support you, you want to support me first. It, it, it's, it would be expedient if you paid my way to where I was going so and yeah. fed me and gave, gave me a little out of pocket something. But you know, it won't be just. It doesn't have to be Ghana must go. It won't be, even if it is uh, Alausa must go. Mm. Or uh, where is that city again? Yeah, Lagos must go. <laughs> <laughs> it would help. And it would not be just one person. Don't forget, it's not the, just. The, all of them. It's not just presidential. It's. Uh, Senatorial, House of Representatives, House of Assembly, governorship. Oh! Um, so, so that this is, is the time to build houses. Largest times. How many times? Times number of people Ooh. to recruit. Delegates are smiling all the way to the back. No, they only need Why to am I not a delegate? Because you are not delegated. Oh. <laughs> Okay, we have finished our own little banter. Let's go to the panel now, who are going to look at this matter seriously with us this morning. It's my pleasure to welcome a legal practitioner, Mr. John Oloyede, whom we haven't seen in a while. Uh, thank you for having me again this morning. Good morning. You haven't seen me in a while because of the political, political economy. economy. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what we have going on in the environment, and mm -hmm. uh, we all have to be part of the cocoa. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I hear someone interested in being a delegate. It's just, it's just I am interested, but nobody will pick me. <laughs> aren't, aren't we all interested? <laughs> okay. Joining us from our studio in Abuja is the chairman, National Conscience Party, Mr. Tanko Yunusa. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. As well as the senior advocate of Nigeria, Mr. Matthew Borka. Good morning, and thank you for being with us. Thank you. Yes. Let thank me you start. For us here. Let me start with you, John. Um, I know that you're not a delegate. Yet. Not yet. <laughs> oh, God. I'm still hoping. <laughs> but please, what are your thoughts about all the things we're hearing about delegates and this uh, convention, these conventions that are about to hold? Well, nothing out of place. It's uh, the season for politics, and um, it's not something we've never heard of before. La Jez, the Cocos, um, <laughs> uh, uh, people telling us that, look, they are ready to fight this battle in pounds and in dollars all over the place. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, the, the delegates are warming up. There are also the super delegates who are struggling not to be exempted from, the, uh, from what is going on all over the country at the moment. Can you just pause a bit? Yes. You just used a new expression. Who are the super delegates? Oh, well, the super delegates are the ones. It's, it's a matter that's going on in the court right now. They are the ones who are political appointees. They, they are the political appointees, the special assistants, ministers, commissioners at the state who level. Who are... Suppose not to be allowed, allowed to, vote. To, to, to vote or be voted, be voted for, for at the primary elections. Okay. Except they have resigned their appointments six months prior to the general election. Ah. And so, I mean, it, most of them are fighting a serious battle now. The courtrooms are, like somebody, a senior colleague said, well, this is the time when 
lawyers make their box because you now have so many pre-election matter, matters being filed all over the place. And this is the time where lawyers who are not, that, that's where I, I probably might become a super delegate by default. <laughs> because of, I mean, if, if lawyers are smiling to the banks, not they're already a delegate. Uh, uh, yes. Uh -huh. They are those who actually will push the super delegates into contention. Okay, let me see if um, the learned silk, you know, agrees with you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Broca, um, are you also an aspiring super delegate, <laughs> directly or indirectly? <laughs> Well, you know, uh, one of the issues that, that, that will come to me readily about this is, first of all, let's, let's deal with that legal angle that, you know, that Mr. Oledi just mentioned, because it is something that is very, very concerning. So there is the 8412 that is also huh. something, you know, related to this whole delegates or don't know, uh, vote or not to vote uh, issue at the Congresses and so many other issues there. Do you, what do you make of all of the melee in the, in the laws that govern the Congresses? Or do you even think we have enough laws governing the Congresses of political parties? Well, let me, let, let me start with what Mr. Oleide said, <laughs> that lawyers are smiling to the bank. Well, I, I, don't, I don't think that's very correct because um, generally, as lawyers, what you do is just to try and interpret and, 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 and guide the court in interpreting the laws. And as far as um, the legal profession is concerned, whether this time or any other time, once you have a good practice, I mean, it, it doesn't matter whether, whether election is coming or not. So this whole idea of saying, well, it is time for lawyers is not really correct. It's actually the time for politicians. Now, coming to the question you asked, I think that in looking at Section 8412, we should not forget that the Senate just amended Section 84.8. Now, it's, it seems to be contradictory because in 84.12, you're trying to exclude a set of people. In amending 84.8, you're trying to bring in uh, uh, statutory delegates. So that, that on its own creates uh, uh, some form of contradiction and, um, and, and um, seems to um, encourage those who, who who co-contend that 8412 uh, seems to target just political appointees. Because just recently, what, is, what, what the Senate did was to amend Section 848 to try and bring back statutory delegates who were inadvertently left out. Now, in the same bit, the same Senate is fighting very hard to ensure that political appointees are not allowed to vote by, by, by virtue of Section 8412. In all of this, what we, what we see is a situation in which um, everybody just wants to be a delegate. And you won't blame those who want to be delegate because they decide everything. It's not just here in Nigeria. You have the same thing happening even in the US, in which it is the person that the political parties present to you that you vote for. We saw it in the, um, um, in the case of, of, of Trump. And, um, and Clinton, in the case of Trump and Biden. And we're seeing it here. At the end of the day, we are in the hands of these delegates. It is who they decide to present to us that we're going to vote for at the end of the day. Which raises the if question, PDP the challenge. Uh, up a just one qu uh, quick one, uh, Mr. Broca. Which raises a challenge indeed, you know, in my own opinion, because if they, they decide everything, well, we'll come to the details of that, probably take it up with uh, Mr. Yunisa. But concerning the laws that you're talking about, one of the things that usually give me a little bit of a concern is if 84.8 and 84.12 are seemingly at variance, I'm wondering what the objective is because I believe that there are lawyers in the two chambers of the National Assembly and I expect that they would have interpreted and counter-interpreted these laws to themselves, these provisions that they are trying to make to themselves. So what, in your opinion, could be the thinking behind the propositions that have been made? Yeah, I think the thinking really, in, let's begin with 8412. I, th I think in the wisdom of the National Assembly, they just felt that, well, if you are a political appointee, and um, you're still in office, you should not use, you should not use that office and, um, and seem to um, gain for yourself an undue advantage over another person who does not hold that office. 
or who does who is who is not an appointee like you. But why I say it, it, it creates a little contradiction is, is, is a sense that while you are doing that in respect of political appointees, you, have, you are coming back again to amend, amend section 84.8 and allow statutory delegates. Who are these statutory delegates? The president, the vice president, um, the deputy governors, members of the National Assembly, members of the State House of Assembly. Now, these are public <coughs> officers. But they are, are elected. They and, um, are elected. In making this law, you want this public. Perhaps the difference is because they are elected. You know, that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, was, I was actually coming to that. Okay. I agree with you. I agree with you 100%. But I'm only saying that in, in all of this, you have arguments on both sides. You have arguments on the part of, 80, uh, of those who are proponents of Section 84.8 to say, well, we are elected, and being elected, we, you, cannot, you, can, you cannot stop us from being delegates. Then you have those who put up the argument for Section 84.12 to say that you cannot make a law to target a particular set of people. And, and, and if you look at the judgment of the Court of Appeal, that was what the Court of Appeal was looking at. The Court of Appeal said, well, this person who went to court does not have the local standard to have gone to court. But if we were to look at the case on the merit, this is a case that targets a particular group of people, and because of that, it is unconstitutional. Mm. All right, let me, let me ask uh, Mr. Yunisa. I'm, I'm, I'm almost certain that it's something that's giving you uh, as well some, a bit of concern. Is it confusing in your opinion, especially for the major actors in the political sphere, talking about political parties and politicians, those two provisions? Let's quickly talk about that because it bothers heavily on the people, the caliber and quality of people that will be shortlisting employees for Nigerians. Oh, okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to agree with Mr. Oloye Lydia with regards to how lawyers are smiling to the bank. And, <laughs> and this is my reason. <laughs> there, there's this tier of um, a preparation for election. You, when you are a politician, you prepare, you prepare first to how to win um, in, the, uh, in the primaries mm -hmm. using the delegates or direct or indirect um, uh, uh, prime, uh, kind of delegate uh, as it were. Then secondly, you prepare for litigation. You keep money aside specifically for litigation. In fact, you heard it so many times where people will tell you that, look, let's do the winning first, then we can do the, the litigation later. So prepare, you prepare for money. And unfortunately, recently, there are people that even prepare for talks. They keep money aside for toggery that may happen during the period. So politicians prepare in that direction. So I, I believe seriously that the lawyers are smelling to the banks, whether you like it or not. Then when you come to the issue of the 84 and the 12 and case, look, there is an undue advantage being given to those who are in position of power. When political appointees or others are being given the opportunity to be at the delegate, which is, of course, an indirect way of election as happened in the political scene. You see, whether the delegate likes it or not, as long as he is, being, he is under the payment or salary of one of his leader, a governor or a member of a representative, any position whatsoever, he has to do the bidding of that particular person, even though he has a contradictory I, I believe as a guard to that particular city, uh, officer in position. So, you see, the idea of removing that particular section or attempt by the, uh, the government as it were, in order, it's just that people wanted to, to eat their cake and have it at the same time, and that is not fair. But I agree totally that uh, um, maybe the position of the president, which the section eight, I guess, that uh, the National Assembly is trying to put back into the Electoral Act is correct, because uh, once you are a leader, definitely you must be at that convention. You cannot be excluded at that convention, and so therefore you are directly a delegate by, 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 by the constitution of the party. So mm -hmm. that has to be included. And I, but what worries me more is this. There was no due diligence as regard to when discussions were being made with regard to the Electoral Act. Why were these particular sections? And why is it not being de de debated on uh, uh, in, at that point in time to make sure that we don't have this back and front, back and front issue on the Electoral Act? And it gives a kind of a confusion to those who want to administer it and those who are being administered to. Because as it is today now, 
Many people do not really understand some of the provisions of the Electoral Act, and it, must be, it will be used in the election. And so it creates a lot of confusion for the electorate and mm. even the party leaders who are going to administer the case and the, the, mm. the, the process. So I think um, quickly that the, uh, uh, um, the players and then the election, the, the chairman of political party should make sure that they study the election so that we will not, we will not um, shoot ourselves in the feet. Before we even start the election, we are having problems with how to administer the election. So we must deal with it and go with what is available now. Otherwise, there will be big problem for, for us at the election processes. Mm. And now, John, um, talking about undue advantage, it just crossed my mind now. A president, for instance, seeking re-election, a governor seeking re-election or seeking to become president, a senator seeking to become president, they are all in political offices and they are all in positions where they have access to Nigeria's money. Um, so should there not be laws guiding how they spend monies if they're seeking election and they are still in these positions. We heard yesterday, for instance, governors were either buying or renting, you didn't specify to us whether they bought those private jets or they were renting them to be able to travel around the, the, around the, the country said, for their campaigns. Well, five million naira per hour, so it sounded like higher, but I don't know. Five, five, million, five million naira per hour, per hour. It's the front page of a newspaper, so... Per hour? <laughs> that's what, what you I, were that's oh, going to ask the question. <laughs> yes, I already asked my question. So is it not unfair, or I mean unfair advantage that they have over all the other contestants because they have access to funds that don't really belong to them? State funds. Everything about elections in Nigeria, everything is unfair. There's nothing free and fair about elections. This is playing out. What is playing out before us now, it, it, it's always been there. But because of the permutations and calculations for 2023, and because of the very complex nature of the kind of elections we're going, going to have, we're seeing this play out. These were things that ordinarily would be discussed in the corridors of power. You see, we don't op actually operate a federal system of government. I'm, I'm, going to the, I'm going to answer the question, mm. but I need to lay the foundation. We, we have a unitary system in place. Ordinarily, why should the National Assembly be involved in making laws in respect of private matters that should concern just the political parties? The Laden Silk said something about the conflict between Section 8412 and 84-8, the new 84-8 mm. that they are proposing, that they, they have now, um, the amendment they are bringing in. Now, what, what is the conflict? The conflict is this. They suddenly discovered that even if, whether the court or the statute says super delegates are allowed, the political parties themselves, do they have provisions in their constitutions to allow super delegates. Now, so, so section 84 of section 8, what it's saying in essence is, look, this, this proviso would apply subject to the political parties, ensuring that in their constitution, it is reflected that super delegates are allowed at the uh, primary elections. Now, some of the political parties have this provision already in their constitution, but it's not in the electoral act. So they are now bringing it in because they suddenly realize that in a couple of months or days or weeks, we are going to have these primary elections and there's a lacuna, there's a gap in the laws guiding these elections. The problem we have is there are basic things you are bringing into public, in the, in, in, into public realm what is basically a situation of private law application. We, they have no business legislating on matters like that. But now you want to control parties at federal, mm -hmm. parties at state level. The political parties are not allowed to make their own constitution, decide whether they... It, all parties don't have to have super delegates. Mm -hmm. It's not all parties that are ruling uh, in Abuja. Mm -hmm. Some parties don't have that. Some parties don't have um, uh, special assistants, commissioners, or whatever. 
So how does the what what concerns you? What of those parties that do not have such such personnel yeah. in their armory? Now, so that is the problem. Now you talk of fair, free, and fair. It's it's, it's never going to be fair for as long as people in power. You, you talk about money bags. Mm. You you hear of uh, people saying, "I'm going to spend dollars. I'm going to spend pounds." Mm. Say why? That is simply because the people, those who are who have power, who they, they never want you have, they, they are voted for delegates at the world level. The last he mentioned the US and says, yes, there are delegates that are elected and all that. Now, in America, the delegates, that's why you have representatives at the state houses of assembly, federal houses of assembly. You can walk into their respective offices in your world, in yep. your locality, mm -hmm. and challenge them. Yes. The next time I hear you say this on the floor of the Senate, you are out of here. Now, the delegates that they have voted, that are supposed to represent us, mm -hmm. by the time they allow super delegates in now, the super delegates will probably be more than the delegates that the people have voted to go and vote in their, 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 their candidates. On their behalf. At the end of it all, the people in power, they continue to force their own candidates on the people. But at, the same, at the same time, Mr. Luyede, yes. these super delegates, yes. these statutory delegates themselves are supposed to be representatives of the people. Well, they are supposed, I agree with you on that. I can't fault that. But when they get there, they are supposed to be representing us. But you see, if you have performed well, if you are sure of your onions that, look, I've done well by my people. Mm -hmm. I, I, can, I, I mean, I, I can't mention names, but the person representing my area, for instance, I'm not going to mention names, in terms of the road network in the area, he's done very well. And I've told people, I don't like his party. But if he comes up for election as a governor, I will vote for him because I've seen what he has done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Now, but these people know that they are, they are so detached. Once they have voted in, they walk away. They take a walk. Yeah. Okay. The people who come from Bariga, they don't, they don't build their houses there. You know, one, one of the things that that's, has struck me about all of this, uh, well, we could, we could go on and on with this confusion, uh, Mr. Burka, but... It doesn't solve the problem. So let's try to look at some issues. Um, at the end of the day, the delegate will determine the people to field for the elections. They will determine who the candidates will be. So we have a, quite a, a load of, of aspirants, both for presidential uh, posts, uh, governorship, Senatorial. legislative roles and all of those things. Mm -hmm. The question I'd like to ask you, Mr. Burka, uh, in our Abuja studio is, what are the questions that we should be posing to these delegates, be super, statutory, whatever it is, the delegates, especially the ones that are coming from the very grassroots? What are the questions you should be, we should be asking them? Because we probably haven't ever really paid attention to how critical their role is because at the end of the day, they will determine who we will vote for, whether it's A or it's B. They are going to literally shortlist a, 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 one political party, for instance, that has 20 aspiring presidential candidates. All right? They will be shortlisted into just one. On the other side as well, whatever the number is, they will be shortlisted to just one. Mm -hmm. What are the questions? that we should be posing to these delegates. We don't have, what, what do we call it now, political debates. There is no political debate among the politicians, among the parties, that the, the delegates will listen to, okay, tell us what you want to do or what, you know, so that we can take you up. We don't have that. So what questions should we be posing to the delegates? Well, thank you very much. I think before I answer that question, uh, let, let me just quickly go back to what um, Mr. Oluyede said, which struck me, it has always been my thought as it relates to Section 84.8 and Section 84.12. It's a misnomer. Misnomer in the sense that 84.12 and 84.8, 84.8 itself starts by saying you recognize by a federal legislation, statutory delegates, members of a political party who have been elected as president, vice president, um, deputy governors, governors, and members of the House of Assembly. Now, he said something which has always been my thought. What about parties 
political parties that don't have any, any person that is elected on those platforms. Mm -hmm. So that is, not a, that, is not a, that is not a thing for national legislation. It should be a thing for political party guideline or political party I mean, um, the constitution. The same thing with 8412. What about political parties who have never tested uh, power? Political parties who have never had the opportunity of being in government to appoint political appointees. So those two sections for me are completely unnecessary. They are even a misnomer. Totally. And I think that political parties, other than those in power, should, be, should, 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 should stand up and challenge those sections. Those are sections that are meant for political parties in power. So it's a misnomer. Now coming to the question that you have asked, um, we have really not paid attention to who these delegates are. As between you and I, mm. apart from the statutory delegates and the super delegates, we don't even know who the other delegates are. We don't know how they emerge. We don't know how they were appointed. We don't even know, we don't even know who they are. So if you don't know their station in life, you don't know where they are coming from, how do you even pose questions to them? Mm. But I know that they are, mm -hmm. they are around, and if they are listening to us, the, quest, the, the questions we'll put to them, as you have said, is please, the destiny of this country is in your hands. Ask the question. Those persons that you are voting for, to be president, governors, or um, vice presidents, I mean, sorry, or, or um, uh, uh, members of the uh, National Assembly, or members of the State House of Assembly, ask the questions, who are they? What have they done for the people? If they have been in power before now, what is their credential? What have they done? If they have not been in power, what, what are those things that makes them better than those who are in power at the moment? I think, I think, I think Mr. Olio did mention something. He said, look, he does not, that he, a representative did something. We should be able to say Mr. A did X, Mr. Y did Z. Now, these are the things that these delegates should help us look at. Because at the end of the day, whatever they do now, whoever they throw up to us, is the person we're going to vote. So we, we are speaking to them now directly to say, don't just do these things based on pecuniary um, interest. Mm -hmm. Look at the interest of the nation. Mm -hmm. Now let me quickly say something. At the, at the commencement of this program, something was said about um, a particular um, the, um, delegate booking hotels and all of that. The truth of the matter is that, except we, we pretend not to know that this has happened, it happens, it has been happening since 1999. It has been happening. Even, even those days when we were in the student movement, you have students vying for elections, doing some of these things, <laughs> getting um, transportation for people to come for Nance, uh, uh, for, for Nance election, booking hotels and all of that. So these are things that have, they have always been with us, except we're we are just <laughs> pretending not to know that they exist, but they do exist. <laughs> Apart from booking of hotels, there are other things that we hear that, that goes on around. Yeah. Today, if you talk to the BDC guys, they'll tell you that, uh, you know what, dollar is high because the convention is about to start. Those are BDC guys. They'll say that to you. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, so Mr. These Mr. things do happen. Uh, Mr. Yunusa, let me ask you the same question yes. that I asked Mr. Loyede here in the studio. Do you not feel that it is unfair for the smaller parties, for instance, the smaller parties that are not in any positions of power yet, when, for instance, a sitting governor is vying for the position of the president and he has access to state funds, so he puts you at a disadvantage since you don't have that kind of money to spend. So shouldn't the National Assembly, sh sh uh, shouldn't the National Assembly be looking to legislate on these kinds of circumstances? Okay, um, before I answer your question, a majority of us don't lie, or many of those political parties don't lie being called smaller parties. <laughs> I was going to say that. Okay, <laughs> I, we are okay. let's just say the, 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 the other parties. The other parties. I apologize. I apologize. The no other problem. parties. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much for the concern soon for us. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me make this uh, 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 position. Uh, there are like four documents that guide our politics the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, which of course is number one, then secondly, the Electoral Act, and the Electoral Act derives its powers from the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. 
And thirdly, then there will be the party constitution. The party constitution derives its own power also through the electoral act, then, of course, dovetail into the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Then, fourthly, the bylaws that happen, which, of course, you have to look at the constitution before, if they are at default, so you now make some correction within that particular, that's why you have bylaws. So, the issue of the party taking probably his decisions as to get to who become who, what become who, come from the Electoral Act as a guide. Then, of course, the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. That is why sometimes you find that there's a, a, a contradiction. If there are contradictions that affect the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria with regard to laws being made at regard to Electoral Act, they have to make sure that they, co they correct the position of the Constitution and they make sure that both of them work in tandem. So we need to be guided by that. Then secondly, the issue of party politics itself. There are two tiers of politics that takes place. The internal party democracy, then before you come to the general election, where you see delegates representing in the party election, they, they are doing internal party electioneering and democracy. So there are groupings that takes place within those particular political parties. So the interest of the candidate is the first thing that they protect within their own grouping. So the electionary take place irrespective of the general election. So you see delegates taking, taking groups and belonging to one group or the other from the interest of the person that, take, that they are interested in. So we know to be guided by that too. Then when it comes to the issue of divergent, there's always, I mean, it's all, it always falls on the laps of the judges to actually now bring out one viewpoint and say, this is the law based on my interpretation of this. But now there, there are as many decisions on issues as there are judges, and that is a big problem. Now, going, now uh, Elijah Yunza has talked about a very, very important thing. It is about, I do, I do, what, I, what I don't agree with is not about debating and all that. You can even say you, are, you have organized debates and some candidates will say we're not coming. Mm -hmm. We have seen that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you are, you are in the media. Nobody amongst us can say what are the core values of the major political parties in Nigeria. What do they stand for? Yet, we are Nigerians. We are members of a nation that is the most populous black nation on earth. We don't know the core values of our core parties, mm -hmm. but we know the core values of the Republican Party in America, mm -hmm. the Democratic Party in America. We know where they stand on abortion. We know where they stand on um, uh, uh, discrimination, on education, on health. We know where they stand on uh, immigration. These are political parties abroad because every, every time they talk, every time a candidate speaks, it talks about the core those, values those, those, of yes. his political party. Yes. But every time a Nigerian politician talks, he, does, he talks about his personal politics, his personal ambition, his personal opinions. That, and that's the problem. So he is a leader of his own people. He is not a leader of a political party. The Nigerian politician leads his own people. The people can be any, any group of people. They could be Okada riders. They could be Almajiris. They could be traders. And that's where it stops. There is no mix in political party setup. There is no mix. So is that to say that the political parties themselves need some educating? Who will educate the political party, unfortunately? Because, because when you, you, who, a, a political party is supposed to be an organic, um, um, a, an organization of people that is supposed to be hierarchy, that is supposed to be governed by laws and mm. rules and all mm. that. Mm. But right now, you have a situation, Section 84, 12, 82, where political parties are mm. being regulated in chains by the National Assembly, a National Assembly that should make laws for the betterment of the people of Nigeria. You are not, the emphasis is always on, look, I say something every time, and I'm going to repeat it today. Why is it that I, last week we were having a discussion, and I told somebody, I said, oh, see, they've given a date for this particular case concerning Section 8412, and that right now it has, it's gotten to the Supreme Court, and that some of us have cases at the Supreme Court that touch the lives 
of people, seriously, of localities. 2014, 2015, 2016. And you go there and you say, when, are, when is my, all the papers are in. When is my case going to get hard? I say, your case is not right for hearing. Yeah, a case of 10, 12 years, not ripe for hearing. Hmm. But then, the, the cases that get hard, that are very serious, I say this with all sense of responsibility, they are the political cases, pre-election matters, election matters, and criminal cases. Hmm. Hmm. I, say, I say, can somebody read between the lines, why is it that criminal cases and politicians' cases are oh, the yeah. two most important cases to the court system? Why? Well, it's a question you have to answer. I can't uh -huh. answer. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's see if Mr. Buruka can help. Mr. Buruka. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I don't know if that, is, if that is something you want to speak to, you may want to speak to it, but, you know, uh, we have to have delegates. I don't know if that's the question, you know, my colleague, my colleague here, uh, Alero, was going to ask you. But we have to have delegates. We have to have well-informed delegates who will give us candidates that people will go out and vote for. That are capable of being voted for. Exactly, because one of the issues here is that we are still struggling with voter apathy. And a good number of people will not go out and vote if it looks like the same of the same. So, are we at a crossroad here, or do you see a way around us getting the right candidates that will vie for office so that people, people can actually have a difficulty choosing the better of the best of the two main political parties? Well, first of all, I think that, um, let me start with the setup by Mr. Oluide. <laughs> He should have answered that question that he asked because he knows the answer. I don't know why he asked the question I and you decide to throw it at me. He should have answered that question. I did. Well, I, 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 I think that the concern that Mr. Oluidi has raised is the concern that a whole lot of people have raised. And the answer is very simple. Those cases get, um, get expeditious hearing because the laws themselves are made by politicians. And what the judges do, what the courts do, is to interpret the law as it is. Now, the law that says pre-election matters must be determined by the, um, by the high court, or the federal high court within 180 days, was, I mean, it's, an, I mean, it's a constitutional provision made by, made by, made, made, made by the lawmakers. Mm -hmm. Now, what, a, what, what the judges do is just to apply of the Constitution, there's nothing they can do about it because that is the law as it is. The law that says, oh, the same pre-election matters must be heard within 60, within 60 days after, after your notice of appeal is, is filed at the Court of Appeal and within 60 days um, when your notice of, uh, 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 from the date of the filing of your notice of appeal at, at the Supreme Court are all constitutional provisions. Now, there is nothing judges can do. The Constitution itself provides for it because the laws are made by the people you're talking about. I mean, that is the law. Judges cannot do anything. Now, the same thing applies to, the same thing applies to election matters. Now, criminal matters do not, before, before election matters started having this preeminence, criminal matters used to have that kind of preeminence in court because the thinking of the court was that these are issues that affect the rights and liberties of, of individuals right and liberties of Nigeria, which is very, very correct. But because of these constitutional provisions, even that is beginning, I mean, your criminal matters don't move at the pace it used to move before. So Mr. Lee uh, didn't lose the answer, and I'll say it. <laughs> the answer, I mean, it works that way because that is the way the laws are structured. They are constitutional provisions. Judges cannot do anything. Now, coming to the issue of the delegates, which are quite the, the, the question, the question you, have, you have asked, I said something earlier. All of us have been saying the same thing. Apart from this statutory of super delegates, the other delegates, you understand, as between you and I, do you know you don't know them? Maybe mm -hmm. you have a friend also who will just call mm -hmm. you and say, "Oh, I've been made a delegate." No, you don't know who these people are. Mm -hmm. But I think that for the um, um, for the political parties in power, Mr. Um, Alaji is here with me. Let me not use major or minor political parties. He's very close <laughs> to me. Let me not say that. <laughs> for the political parties in power, or those who have been in power. 
the 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 point the 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 point is I think for their presidential delegates they try to put in people who are very enlightened. I mean I've, I've had interactions with one or two of them who are delegates for so the, so a lot of them are very enlightened, and I think that um, 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 the the fact that some of sorry some of some of them actually know the enormity of what they are doing, but the unfortunate thing really is that between 99 between 1999 and now you cannot take away money in electoral process whether it is at the delegate level or at the national uh, um, uh, at the general election level now sometimes you hear politicians come to say oh this person could not even deliver his polling unit <laughs> they know what they are talking about or um, this um, this delegates this this delegates are sure for Mr. A or Mr. B or Mr. C. I think the way around it is that we should continue to talk to this, uh, um, to these our brothers and sisters, to these Nigerians who have the opportunity from next week to um, choose for us the people that we're going to elect. Mm. As I said earlier, I'll still repeat it. They must realize the fact that the destiny of this country is in their hands. Okay. Now, all over the world, as I, as I say, in major democracies, I mean, even, even, even in the US, at the end of the day, it is, who, it is who the party men throw to you that you're going to elect. I use the word party men um, advisedly in the sense that in other democracies, you have, you have all those who are members of the political party participating in the process. Okay. Here in Nigeria, there was an attempt by the National Assembly to say, oh, all elections should be by direct primaries. And a lot of concerns we are raised. I also raised that concern because it would have it would have been Mr. that Borka, it would have been like Mr. having Borka, two elections. All I, members of the political I, party. I beg would your vote. pardon, Mr. Borka. We have to start winding down now. So I just like to to take your last mm -hmm. word on this subject. We need to wind down. Oh, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Mm. Now, my last word on this is to say that all over the world, um, for you to have a say in the political process of your country, you must be a member of a political party. These delegates are members of political parties. Um, uh, 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 if you go to America, for, for you to choose who will be the flag bearer of the Democrats or the Republicans, you will be a member of the political party. So my advice is that anywhere you are as a Nigerian, at the local level, at the, at the polling unit level, ward level, local government level, try and belong to a political party. Those are the people who determine what we do. Okay. If, if they throw up Mr. A and Mr. B, we can only vote between, um, be, um, and choose between Mr. A and Mr. B. Okay. So Nigerians must find a way to belong. Okay. I'll let her find a way to belong. Okay, <laughs> I will. Elijah Yunusa, your last word, please. <laughs> <laughs> With reference to some of the issues that was raised by Mr. Doidi, uh, interestingly, we, in the National Conscience Party, we are still in court, we are in court for waiting for judgment for over a year. So this is not criminal matter, it's actually political matter, and yet it has not been dealt with for over a year. Unfortunately, the judge was been transferred from Lagos to Kano, and up to now we are waiting for judgment. And I raised an issue with regard to political education for a political party. Alaji Yunusa, your yes, final word, party your has, final word, uh, please. Institution. <laughs> yes, they have institution. I just wanted to say that when we were IPAC, when I was IPAC chairman, we have a, an institution to train political party leaders. It is there in Kuru. It trains political party from chairman, secretaries, law and law, uh, legal advisor, every strata of that particular uh, political, so that they can be well abreast with their party manifestos and their constitution and anything that is nationalistic that will help our polity to grow. Okay. That institution is in Kuru, so okay. political parties should take advantage, full advantage of that institute. Mr. Loyede. Yes, I think this is by divine inspiration. I just had this word now, drop box. But the drop box I'm talking about is D-R-O-P-B-U-C-K-X-S. You know, the American embassy, they have this drop box policy. Mm -hmm. if, you have been, if you have been given visa before, you just bring your visa application, you drop box, right? Now, the problem we have in Nigeria is akin to the drop box syndrome. People, politicians are dropping money, dropping money. Let us all shun this drop box mentality because that is the bane of political growth in Nigeria. Mr. Wonder, John Oloyede. I wonder how that's going to happen though. Legal <laughs> practitioner and we also had joining us from our studio in Abuja, Alaji Tanko Yunusa, Chairman, National Conscience Party, as well as Leonard Silk, Matthew Burka. Thank you all very much, gentlemen. But
just a little word here. Um, something was said about, it was you who said it, about the political parties. Maybe they need to have a rethink from what Mr. Loyedi has said about making their parties distinct in one area or other so that we all know exactly what they stand for and these political nomads will cease traveling all over the political space. Mm. I say amen. Uh, Sunrise will be right back in a second with another interesting conversation. Join us. I just said amen. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. Uh, well, you know we talked about biodiversity the other time, and I tried to use my <laughs> extremely limited bio understanding. <laughs> diversity, plenty. <laughs> that was what you said. But, <laughs> but I don't know. I'm not even going to go into it. Let's just welcome. <laughs> well, ju just to begin by saying that the 22nd day in May every year is a day set aside to celebrate the International Day for Biological Diversity. See? Oh, it's biology. Okay, not true. Sorry. Not bi. It's bio, not bi. Okay. <laughs> to raise awareness of the vital importance of preserving biodiversity again. The theme for this year is building a shared future for all life. Mm -hmm. Please join me in welcoming Professor Adeshola Adipojo, who is Director General Forestry Institute of Nigeria. He joins us virtually from Ibadan. Thanks for joining us this morning, Prof. Um, you have heard me embarrass myself by trying to define <laughs> biodiversity so lamely. Maybe we'll begin by that, uh, with that, by at least trying to understand what biodiversity is for people like me who are as ignorant. Sis, thank you. I think sincerely you've not embarrassed yourself. Oh, you'll really? still find that uh, in the midst of what you have said, is still part of the answer. It simply means varieties of life or heart. And uh, it has to do with plants, animals, and microorganisms. So you still find out that within what you have said, we can still place it under any of these uh, sub -edits. So it's basically talking about how do we go be together on art and everybody benefiting from each other without any party extincting the other party, which is the reason why we're facing so many challenges today because uh, we don't respect other uh, part of the biodiversity, be it plant, be it animal, and be it microorganisms. And when any of them is missing along the line, without being a factor to one, the, uh, one or the other, then you have set one post free, which possibly could affect human health and will begin to run up and, up and down like we are on, uh, my, on uh, COVID. Mm. Well, mm. perhaps uh, the begin where we, we began to do that to ourselves is um, urbanization. Um, you know, uh, development, uh, as we often say, uh, such that, you know, I don't know, maybe you want to explain to us at what point we began to undo nature, so to speak, because it would seem like there, there is a need to pay attention because we've been doing something wrong. Sincerely, urbanization has nothing to do with uh, tampering with the uh, biodiversity. I think the problem really lies with understanding, and I don't want to see uh, uh, ignorance in the side of so many. Uh, there are something we call Man and Bosphere, which I chair for the whole world, uh, it's under UNESCO. All we're saying in Man and Bosphere is that man and the Bosphere, which is another word for biodiversity, should learn how to live harmoniously. You can depend on each other. When you are first from the biodiversity sustainably, then you are fair to each other. But when you depend on need to extinct one species or the other, then you are beginning to cause crisis. That's why the title for this year says building a shared future for all life, because it's all about life. Perhaps another understanding to come. When you, 
if you say you know urbanization urbanization has nothing to do with the degradation that we have been experiencing then what is causing what necessitated this day i have thought that i mean um urbanization uh, has attempted to eliminate certain um, aspects of life um, around people for instance people don't want snakes they don't want you know all these reptiles around them so they they pave or uh, you know all of the, the their compound so there's no plant in the compound and all of those things uh, creating fences around themselves and also i thought that that's the kind of urbanization plus yes, you know industrialization you know chemicals and all those things so you, you want to say something about that that, that's part of the uh, uh, lack of uh, awareness or ignorance I'm talking about because okay. when you plastered or concrete every part of your house, already you are chucking yourself out of oxygen. The more green around you, the better. If you look at the master plan of the SCT, you realize that there are a lot of green area that were naturally embedded in the master plan that people are now probably tampering with. All of these were to make oxygen sufficient apart from keeping these things alive. And when you get to a, what we call either violet or that's a natural forest, in that environment we say the animals has the right of way. Even if you are driving and you find a snake crossing, you are expected to stop for the snake to cross I see. before you continue your, your journey. But because snakes, snakes are not your enemy, they are also scared of you, was why when they cannot escape, they turn to attack you. Mm. But if you allow them to operate in their own ecosystem mm. and you don't go to intrude mm. because you are going to their habitat and you are chasing them in their own habitat, mm. then you don't have issues with them. But people thought or begin to believe that when you plaster almost everywhere around you, uh, you are enjoying life. No. That's why you find the urban extremely hot and when you go to the uh, so ecosystem, you begin to wonder why the change in the, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the in the weather there. Because mm -hmm. every green exudates oxygen and take in your own uh, carbon dioxide that's a waste as their own food. Mm -hmm. And you take the, uh, the oxygen they are exudating, which is a byproduct of every uh, plant or microorganism into your own system. And they also even eat when you go to any upper or what we call um, arboretum, and the plants there are medicinal, and you go as early as 6, 7 a.m., and you inhale those exudates of this plant, you find that you are earlier mm. Mm. than just uh, using AC to circulate the same uh, air, mm. air around you. Mm. Thank you. Now, now, Prof, uh, I, as we opened this program today, we talked about urbanization to the extent that um, the example we actually gave was Lagos and Shagamo, that when I was in university, you drove from Lagos to Shagamo and you could see greenery on either side of the highway. But now it's like <laughs> Lagos and Shagamo are now one town. You get to Shagamo and you see that you have seen villages and settlements all along the road and all the greenery that you saw many, I mean, I mean, some years ago have disappeared. So I'm sure that is what Ayo was talking about when he was talking about urbanization. How is that affecting biodiversity? since all those greens which you say are so important to our life to our lives have all disappeared sincerely the two of you deserve to be ambassadors of environment because you're just speaking you're speaking to the problem we are facing now because uh most of the the this uh micro ecosystem that you used to know are disappearing and uh we have also lost so many species of plants that Apart from if you come to our Iberium in forestry research east of Nigeria, then you won't have an idea of how some plant or insect looks like. Uh, what was, uh, what is the what is directly responsible to this that uh, my principals in the, in the ministry, the ministers are addressing, is how do we collaborate with each of these things? Because remember, the land land use act are taking the power over land to the state. 
And um, when you are not replenishing, that's exactly the point I'm trying to make. Uh, even we that are in forest researchers of Nigeria also harvest from the forest. But we are saying you should do this harvesting sustainably in a way that it will not affect uh, uh, the entire ecosystem. But what we are even seeing, not only to Shagamu, driving from Lagos to Ibadan, you are only seeing the edge of the road. There is nothing behind it anymore because all has been uh, deforested, both legally and otherwise, away from those places. And that is why the runoff of water begin to move faster and the erosion is increasing and the gully erosion is building. And that's why we have a lot of land degradation problem. So that is not what we call urban, but because there's something we call urban forestry, which we are not saying you should not develop, but make sure that you respect the trees you find, the one that is not obstructing uh, your, your building, you let it be. And when you take anyone off where you are building, ensure that you replace them around the house. Then that will still maintain the ecosystem and balance the, the carbon in the, in the air. Hmm. But Prof, where did we begin to get this wrong? Here is why I'm asking. The country, the Federal Republic of Nigeria, is a signatory to many of these uh, treaties, agreements, you name it, concerning climate change, environmental protection, and all those things. And they're supposed to be domesticated, not just in Nigeria as a nation, but to the sub-regional levels, even the sub-sub-regional levels, if I can use the term, local governments, uh, states, and the rest of them. So, and what you said just now about, the, about us just seeing the face or faces of the forests that behind the forests off of the roads they have been you know pulled down you know houses have been built on them and all of that uh, there are many many people who can easily relate with that so is it that the message is not getting home to the states who literally superintend over the 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 forests and all of them and the federal government is just producing providing should we just say pro providing backups of you know protection and all of those things is it that the message is not getting home to the authorities or that we are just paying lip service to the agreements that we sign okay let me take it uh, that, that that your question in two part one the federal government is doing its own part if you remember 2019 precisely 23rd of september the president made a commitment in Onga that will be planting 25 million trees uh, annually. Uh, at that, we will not be able to plant 25 any year, or at least we have once or twice exceeded 20 million. But what we're not doing is to approach states indi individually. Any state that is willing, then we'll collaborate with them, do an MOU, they provide us land, and we'll begin to plant uh, on, a, on a relationship basis that we don't need the economic part of this tree we are planting, but just to allow the tree to survive, to contribute to a carbon sink, why you can uh, allow your your inhabitants or your communities around there to benefit economically from those who are planted so that uh, uh, symbiotically we can manage whatever we, we are provided. Mm. But the challenge or the challenges we are having really uh, lies with the state. Uh, if you go to the state, the state is the only uh, state in this country that has uh, uh, Ministry of Forestry. And they are the only one housing the only biosphere we had before, before we added three last year, which is Omo Biosphere Reserve, uh, where you can still find the wide elephant in their tents. Uh, that's why you must have been hearing that sometimes they, they come out of the bush and, to, and take over the Bini. Uh, uh, Ijebu road. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the problem we're having with the federal is doing their own part because National Park is keeping of about eight or seven percent uh, forest cover we have today. About three percent is with uh, National Park. Uh, free is holding about two point something percent. Why uh, stakeholders and some state? Now, if you go to Gombe State, they are doing what they call go green. They are promoting and they are are partnering with so many of, uh, of our uh, outfit there. We are planting for Gumbi almost every year. The same thing, Kaduna. Bono State is doing that. Uh, Adamawa is doing that. 
uh, Niger wanted to start with us last year, but because of the insecurity uh, they are facing. So individual state, I mean states on their own approach us, we do MOU and we work with them to increase uh, for the country. But some states that are not interested, you can't force them because the Land Use Act and give them the power over their land. Okay. So uh, except the, the welcome you can't do otherwise. But it does, I, I still go back to that same question of understanding what the issues are because the implications are not just for today. They are for maybe a decade, two, maybe centuries from now. So if the implications of their actions or inactions are lost on them, then we are literally destroying the future from now. So is, do you think that the implication is lost on them? I ask, my, my apologies, I ask that question against the backdrop of the fact that virtually every state has a Ministry of Agriculture but when you talk about Ministry of Diversity, I mean, beg your pardon, Ministry of Forestry, there will be questions around, you know, duplicating of uh, functions and all of those things. So if, is it that the implications, the humongous implications of protecting biodiversity is lost on the states that are not paying attention, so to speak? Let, let me clear that, uh, because each time agriculture is mentioned, it makes me very uncomfortable mm. uh, because agriculture is part of the problem of forest uh -huh. because they clear land and they must cut down the trees so that the agricultural or uh, annual uh, uh, planting they want to make can survive. Mm. So we are, are putting it from different angle. One, that's why we're preaching what we call agroforestry. That means you can do spacing in planting trees and still do your cropping within these trees and you still achieve the same thing. But the second aspect we're preaching is that they should do intensive farming. If you go to Japan, most of the Asian countries that don't have land, they could farm on the same land three, four times a year because they have that variety. So they work with limited land, but because we are always have this erroneous belief that we have fast land and everything must be clear for farming. And so that is also having consequence, uh, consequences on us. So we don't uh, uh, work with agri, we work more with Ministry of Environment. But what I'm saying is that Ogun State has separated even forestry from environment. Mm. So that, that's the point I'm trying to make so that they can pay attention to, to, to the forest cover because there's a, there's a difference between vegetation cover and forest cover. Mm. Okay. Vegetation cover means you can have grass that gives you an impression that it's green, mm -hmm. but during the dry season, the grass turns brown. But if it is tree, that is forest cover. Okay. Now, straight to your question now, uh, I want to answer you honestly that most states understand the implication, but they are carried away or overwhelmed with the economic benefits of taking this wood off where they are. And mm. I, don't want to, I don't know how to put it that they know that uh, the consequences probably may not be some of them in the office. And this is what we've been preaching, okay. that let's work for the future and not now. Mm -hmm. So it's the economic benefit, the immediate economic benefit. And if it's even being plowed back to the same ministry, plant back what they have taken, it will have been better. But when this revenue is generated, it's not taken back to the same place it was taken from. Just when you, you talked about economic benefits now, I want to understand what you mean by that. Because there are those who believe that foreigners come from various parts of the world to uh, cut our trees, harvest them, export them out of the country and bring back, uh, you know, finished sure. products and all of that. Mm -hmm. So is that what you're talking about? Yes, there's no law that asks you to take such out and bring finished product. The rule is you must take out of any country. That is the scientist's rule. You must take out of any country, process, that's the word, process wood, mm -hmm. not the log. Okay. And as I speak to you, the Federal Ministry of Environment has its ban still place on exporting this wood out of the country, but still going out. So the Federal Ministry of Environment is not, man it does not have that power to know how they are going out. Mm. So who should, who should know? 
we have written to everybody who we expected to know and who should take uh, 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 appropriate action. Mm. And everybody will tell you action has been taken. But most times you still find out that where are these logs going? But if you find them in a sawmill today, tomorrow they are not there. And so where are they disappeared to? Mm. Now, Prof, do you think that there is enough awareness in Nigeria about all these things that you're talking about? Because in some cases, I'm sure you have found, those who are doing the logging are those in the villages who have no idea what biodiversity is, what forest cover is, and all that. So are we doing enough awareness from when people are young so that they grow up to appreciate the greens around them, the trees, and what benefits they are to human beings? Sincerely, with the awareness, I, 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 can agree, I may agree with you that probably it's not enough, uh, that we should do more. But uh, I still want to believe that um, we're doing the awareness and around where we have this forest, our presence uh, is, 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 is there. And we, beyond the awareness, they are also being empowered. I share with you the Omobas Forest Reserve I told you that's in Ogun State. Korean government for keeping that forest alone still came to that forest and invested about 10 million in the life of the dwellers there to, uh, I mean, empower them in one of the uh, activities they are doing the other. Because all we are trying to preach is where if we are saying they should not kill uh, fishes from the stream with chemicals, then establish them with fish pond, which we did in our um, mobile forest. Uh, if we say, okay, do, let them not put fire in the forest because they are looking for grass cutter, then domesticate some for them, which we have done also in Omo. So if you go to the communities around Omo, they are fully aware and they are embracing. The same thing if you go to Bini, Olonibe, Sakoba area, they believe in what we're doing and they are part of it. Mm. The same thing if you go to Cross River, Okwango, they are, they are always enthusiastic to see us because we work together. But what we are saying is uh, when you are allowing the, these foreigners to have access to them and they begin to entice them with the kind of money they've not seen before. So they're they going to work with them. Yeah, but yeah. if they are not allowed to assess them, mm. probably if they don't have approval mm. to even cut those law in the first place, so they, don't, they won't have these community people to, do, to romance mm. to have their way. You and the federal government does not have the power to give approval. Approval lies with the states. Hmm. Who has the who the land use act has empowered control by a state? Yes. All this, the federal government can do through us or other agencies is to advise them on the implication of this and which we're doing. And we're hoping that uh, this will improve. You just spoke about um, killing fish with chemical. I mean, how does that happen, one? And I know that in Lagos area at one time around Makoko, we heard that a lot of mercury was found in the fish that was being caught and sold in that area. How does that happen? You know, these uh, people in the rural area, sometimes could be terribly mischievous. They don't even know the implication of these chemicals because they also eat out of these uh, fishes, the, the, the whatever. So they block stream at one end and and at another end, particularly where they know that there are a lot of uh, body, uh, water body there, then they could put snipers or whatever in it, knowing fully well that this fish, yes, or the world, you know, government change or whatever, knowing fully well that these fishes will rush out or some will die and float. But because you will just stop by the road and pick these fishes, you may not know actually how they were harvested from with whatever body, uh, water body. Oh, God. So that's Prof. what was. I ask everybody. To, to thank, thanks for discouraging us from eating fish. <laughs> <laughs> not only fish, not only fish, even the bush meat you buy on the road. You may not know how they were killed. Oh, God. Mm. Even the seedlings you buy in nurseries or by the roadside, you may not be sure how they are raised. Some will tell you that this is uh, uh, grafted, and you most of them come back to us. I planted this particular three species in my house. I was told that it will start fruiting five years. It has spent 10 years. It's not fruiting. I will take them to some who have done in our offices and said, look at this, it's three years. 
look at this is two years they are floating why do you go to the roadside hmm. uh, prof um we have we seem to have moved from fishery to from uh, forestry well, to fishing it's, um, it's all about yes i know i know i'm just trying to you know, like anything in the forest okay is either, is either flora or fauna Okay. Our is non-timber forest product. Okay. The fish itself is what we call non-timber forest product. Okay. It's part of okay. the same thing with snail. Here's where I'm going, Prof. You started to answer the question, so please answer all of it. What are the general components or elements or sphere of biodiversity? Just so that someone who has no idea what we are talking about can be educated and begin to take um, caution. Is, there are basically three components. The animals, the plants, the microorganisms. Okay. And all of them must live harmoniously with human. When you say, what, when you say microorganisms, please educate. Those ones that you cannot see with your eyes. But are also, like, like you eat your food, you put it in your, in your mouth, there's an enzyme in your mouth that has to mix with the food to digest it. But you can't see it with your eyes. Correct. So what's that got to do with the things that are going on outside? Because most of these plants and animals you are talking about, they relate, they are affected to one microorganism or the other. That is why people are saying uh, uh, coronavirus is from one animal or the other. But to that animal is not injurious, but to human is injurious. And so when that animal is taken out, you have said that microorganism free, and when interface with man, the man will react. Please slow down, Prof. Now I'm, I'm getting confused and scared. Um, we, we, there's a lot of stories around how the coronavirus disease came to be in the first place. Came from an animal, just as you have said. But um, in terms of taking it out, uh, I don't understand what you mean because you're an African. People will always eat bush meat. Okay, let me give you this simple example. <laughs> This cup is mine, okay. and it, it, it works well with me. And if I'm no longer available, and my son or somebody has put it on the head, probably there is, uh, the person's allergy to uh, what is in my own sweat. So you see the person reacting. So also, is every microorganism work with a particular vector? Or that the vector, I mean, this could be animal, it could be plant. But when you take out the host, you set that is that, that particular microorganism free, and that to assist. So you ask to condition itself to assist on another host, and the host will react. So when the host reacts, you begin to say it's an infection or it's a disease or whatever. Okay. So in terms of from what you have said now, how vulnerable are we on Earth to things that we do not know, understand, or are willing to accept easily? I will see. Okay. The, the, the more we allow the ecosystem to remain intact, the safer we are. Mm. The more we are degrading and taking some species out into extinction, the more vulnerable we are to what we don't know about. That sounds like the abridged version of the answer. But Prof, <laughs> there are implications. Okay, so we, we talked about the implications of urbanization, industrialization, and the rest of it. Earth will, I mean, human beings will always um, evolve from one thing to the other. Technology wasn't here about 200 or even 100 years ago at the level at which it is now. So the, the marriage or the balance of industrialization development over the years, cum uh, biodiversity, uh, we need some, maybe a roadmap or a template of the balance. Is that lost on us, or we're just ignoring it? The, the, that's the word. The balance is what we are talking about, and that's where the title of this year is saying, build a shared future. That shared future is talking about the word we just used now. Balance it out. Ensure that nothing is extincted and nothing is taken out. Make sure that you are relating with each other sustainably. So how so that, do we get that done, Prof? How do we do, do that? It's simply to just respect everybody who is on the on the heart. That's the plant, the animals, and the microorganism. Uh, and and I've tried to explain to you today. Take Lagos for example. You can hardly find any one hectare 
uh, uh, forest anywhere in Lagos. Thank God they are even doing the median and some uh, parts are green up now to better uh, um, bring, down, bring down the, the temperature of, of that environment. But what we're saying is that we must promote green. If you are building your house, ensure you leave some portion of that part of your house, either for a small orchard or for a small green environment, that mm. will better the life of the inhabitant of that compound. Mm. So you are not doing the community environment, and that's why uh, in, in the developed world, they will believe that if you spend more or if you take care of your environment, you're going to spend less on it. Yeah, but, but Professor, you need to explain to us how we're going to learn to respect the mosquito <laughs> and learn that it has a right to live because it is killing us. Mosquito cannot be around your house if there's no water, uh, stagnant water around your house. If you don't, if there's no any water uh, uh, around there that where it's going to breed from, it will not exist. And mosquito has a very short lifespan. If it does not get somebody to, to or any uh, factor to live on two, three days, it's dead. Prof, you have just raised another problem now <laughs> from this thing that you just said. So uh, there are no, if there are mosquitoes around, naturally. You don't have stagnant water around you. There's mosquito there no... everywhere, Professor. They are it's everywhere. Stagnant water around them. Go and see, there must be drainage somewhere around you okay. that's not flowing. Our drainages are open in Nigeria. But if it's flowing, you have no challenge. They hardly flow. <laughs> That's where the problem lies. They hardly flow. So that's what I'm saying. If we spend more in keeping the environment clean, then we're going to spend less. Hmm. Well, the, the, perhaps uh, um, Alero needs to check her drainage system and all over the city of Lagos anyway, you know, because we, we literally... At if the I check the one on my street, what about the one on the next street? Well, that's the problem. You have to talk to yourselves. For biodiversity, <laughs> you know. But you know, well, Prof... You. <laughs> prof, um, this information that you're giving, simplistic as it, as it sounds, seems lost on us and it looks like the micro uh, a microcosm of the various issues that we need to replicate all over the place i remember it was in the fashola government i think that many people began to call him the is it the flower governor or something baba flower baba flower he all he did was you know green you know make that was a wonderful job he did yes, yes. Wonderful job. it was you know that was done at the time so in terms of getting it done, uh, we essentially don't, shouldn't have to limit it to government from what you were saying just now. Exactly. So for the person listening to us in various parts of Nigeria at this moment, what can they do today? It's a Saturday morning. What can they do today? What can they do now in order to begin to um, buy back some of the green that we may have lost and build fact, a better biodiversity? I have the mandate of my principals, that's my ministers, if you have land that you have a charity to, and you want to partner with us, we'll do an MOU with you. We'll bring seedling free of charge, plant on your land. All our own MOU is please don't cut this tree. Whatever is the food benefit you are getting from it, you can go away with it. We don't need that really. Or you give to the really? best privilege to be around you. But we, the development is promoting via various means that we must keep planting. In fact, the challenge or challenges, one of the challenges we're having now is having enough land to plant mm -hmm. in view of the various security challenges we have a state that uh, we have mm -hmm. the land. So if anybody, private organizations that have land and want to partner with us, please, they are free to write us and say, we have this land, I have a charity to it. Why we're asking for charity is we don't want to plant because it's costing federal government a lot of money mm -hmm. and a year or two later, you will tell us the land is on the uh, dispute or whatever, and somebody is clearing off what we are labor to. Uh, it's costing the government a lot of money mm -hmm. to, to raise those seedlings to plant. And we have shortened gestation period mm -hmm. for those who want to plant around their houses. Most of the fruit you are thinking could take 20, 30 years to fruit. We are shortening their gestation period to five, maximum seven years. We have a bono which that is fruiting at five years now. Mm -hmm. We have a... Uh, uh, veterinary that share butter, fruiting at five years, and so many others. Mm. Well, at least we're giving mandate to work on 10 indigenous tree species 
when I build to number seven or eight now, that are fruiting at five to seven years of age. So the adage of evil plant do not live to harvest is no longer there. Mm. You will, so you can even get this plant around your, your your houses, and this will also contribute to what we're talking about. So, Prof, what kind of land is? Does it have to be a large expanse of land, or is there a minimum um, size to the land that you would come to plant on? Little for one hectare is is good for us. Okay, that's. Okay. Now, uh, how about wetlands? There are people who buy property, who buy, you know, landed property, and they buy wetlands, uh, which someone or maybe the state or somewhere, you know, may have sold to them. How do we protect those? Should governments be selling wetlands, or should they be using wetlands for anything else other than? environmental uh, no it's not even advisable because those are the areas we have been mandated to turn because every wetland if you trace it further you realize that it's coming from uh uh from the, the either from the ocean or from one sea or the other so and the, uh, those areas are supposed to be planted out into what we call mangrove because if you notice that there are, there are plants also that also survive uh, in the water environment which is what we call mangrove forest which we are also doing, or we are, we are about starting around rivers towards uh, Baesa now to to save all of those area because if your mangrove is doing well, then you have less of water coming to the interland. Well, Prof, we have to thank you very much for your time this morning because it's been quite illuminating, and hope that. A sizable number of us have taken home the lessons. Professor Adishola Dipoju is Director General Forestry Institute of Nigeria. Thank you so much. And uh, Professor, happy you, Biodiversity friend. Day tomorrow. Thank you so much. And I hope you also start planting. Well, that's a very, very good one. I'll also take notes. All right. <laughs> um, we'll take a short break now when we return. The show continues. Please stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. Now we're going to take a look at the Pacelli School for the Blind, which, if I'm not mistaken, is the oldest school for the blind in Lagos. It's been 60 years since it was established. 60. <laughs> mm. Six and decades. It's six decades, specifically a school for the blind, and it's a non-governmental and non-fee-paying institution. Mm. So how has the Pacelli School survived all these years? Well, we have Sister Jane Onyeneri of the Handmaids of the Holy Child Jesus with us. Good morning. Good morning, Ma. And she's come along with one of the students, Amos Timothy. Morning, Amos. Good morning, Ma. How are you today? I'm good, thank you, and you? Great, thank you. So, Sister Onyeneri, 60 years yeah. of looking after the blind. I don't suppose you've been there 60 years because you <laughs> no, don't look to me like you're 60. All, not at all. You're right. So yeah. how long have you been there? Um, 11 years. Okay. Now, what has your experience been working with blind children? It has been very awesome because I have a great passion for the visually impaired children. I read that. And you will tell us why in a short while. So okay. You finish your sentence. <laughs> yes. So it has been so great working with them. It gives me that inner joy and fulfillment that these children, I'm like their eyes, their nose, everything. So, so that's the way I feel. And I take care of them. Mm. Yeah. Why are you partial 
to children with visual impairment? Because they are neglected in our society, especially the blind. People don't talk about them. Lagos State have no school for the blind, except this one. I Diocese of Lagos has uh, started since the 16th of June, 1962. That's the only school for primary school. So uh, the government will have pleaded with them if they can get another school. Right now, our school is overpopulated, and there are some of these children that are left behind. It makes me feel so bad that our society is not thinking about them. When you say overpopulated, what's the population? It's 140, 140 oh. children, and we have to build double bunk to accommodate some of them. And there are about 40 of them on the waiting list. We cannot accept. Would, would you, what, what would you say is the population, if if that's a, a good word to even use, or uh, what's the need gap that, that needs to be mm -hmm. filled? Mm -hmm. Like uh, that school supposed to be maybe 100. No, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the general pop, uh, you know, population that have the need for this school, for the black They children. may reach up to 100. Hmm. Yeah, that have the need. But so Apart we, from the 140 that you have? We, yes. Okay. There are, so there's a need for another blind school that will, come, will accommodate at least 100 pupils? Yes. Any specific age range? Yeah, we have 7 to 17 okay. age range. And right now, the handmaids of the Holy Child Jesus have purchased land at Badagri to you know, make sure that we build that school so that we can accommodate these children that are sitting down at home. Mm. We have purchased the land, but we have, we need capital to develop the land. So you, you have records of some, some children who have this need, who are not in a restructured in school. school. Yes. Mm. Right now. We do. Okay. And yeah. then there are those who have this need and who are in the general schools with like everybody else. Yes. And also, some of them are sitting down at home. And some of these children are abandoned by their parents. They become our children. We have about 10 of them that are with us mm. in the convent. So they get bored being with us. So we now put them in another facility. Would you say this is a pro, pro, well, this is a challenge that just started or is something that's been on for a very long time? It has been there. It has just been there. This need gap. The need has been there because they visually impaired. Nobody think about them of say, let us make a place or say build a place for to accommodate this group of people. Deaf mm -hmm. people are taken care of. They have primary school, so many primary school, they have secondary school. But the blind do not have. But we integrate them in Queens, Kings and Ijaniki. That's the only school that accept them. For secondary school for level. For secondary school level. Mm. And so, then Layola Jeshwit Abuja. Mm. Sister, from your experience, what is mainly responsible for their blindness? Were they born blind? Uh, some of them are born blind. Some is hereditary. Some accident. Some you know, glycoma. Um, mm. Some of them have... Uh, Didn't know that you could get glycoma so young. Yes, some do. Some accident playing on the field or some, uh, we had a case two years ago when the child was in kindergarten, nursery school, a teacher slapped that child. That was how that child became blind. Wow. From a slap? Yeah, and then another one three years ago took a expired medication, cough medication, the child got blind. Wow. So these are some of the cases we see. And most of our children come from Ogun State and Delta. There is a family, there are four of them. There are another family, five of them. So All blind? Yes. OK, um, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I have too many questions and no questions at all right now. But you know, in, in, in terms of how this you know, partially school for the blind and partially uh, uh, visually impaired uh, have dealt with these issues over the years. What are some of the uh, stories that you have heard? Uh, I'm asking that against the backdrop of the fact that, okay, so this, this school has been on and has handled this issue for 60 years. Uh, are there, first of all, what are the success stories or challenges that you can point to that people need to be uh, 
to appreciate. Okay, uh, at school, over the 60 years, we have graduated up to 2,000, 2,000 students from Pachali, and they are doing so great. We have gotten barristers, musicians like Koban. We have uh, uh, those mm. working in the radio station. Koban Zasuko. Yeah, well, it's an Espachelian. Okay. And then uh, we have some of them that are telephone operators, bankers. In fact, the inner joy I get every day that I saw that some of them are happily married with children. You know, the society don't frown about it once you are gainfully employed. Our uh, ladies are ready to marry them and men. Mm. So that is the success story, and it makes us feel good that these children can make it. You know, I used to joke with them and say the sky is their limit. They say, no, sister, is our starting point. So it gives me <laughs> inner joy to hear that, that they have that hope. That look, I'm going to be somebody in future. Mm. Now, this. How about the challenges? Uh, some of our challenges. Besides uh, the schools, the one that you have just mentioned already. Money, <laughs> money, money. <laughs> finance, finance okay. is our challenge and flooding. You know, the children oh. do not pay any form of tuition. Mm -hmm. It is a free education. Both the, um, the dormitory is free, accommodation, uh, feeding, mm. educational material is free. And it is true, uh, wonderful people of Nigeria, we are wonderful people. There are still wonderful people in Nigeria that contribute every day to put food on our table. Corporate organizations, religious bodies, clubs, private schools have also been awesome and individuals who come by to celebrate their birthday. That is how we make money to pay staff for 48 staff and then feed these children. 140. Yeah, and it's amazing. I keep telling people, if you are looking for miracle, come to Pacheli. It's where miracle comes because the money is not there, but they will come. That is our strong belief. If you can hazard a guess, What's the, what would you say the budget need of Pacheli School for the Blind is on maybe an annual basis or a monthly basis? Uh, monthly basis, we spend roughly three million every month because the children destroy so much. Mm. You know, one child, 40 of them, or you know, the boys are 92. They touch, touch, touch. Everything is touching. We uh, have to repair. Most of the money donated to us is for repairs. What do you mean, touch, touch, touch? You know, they destroy uh, their, their restroom. They destroy the door. They they have to feel legs. around before they... They feel like they do a lot of touching. Mm. So, and then do so painting, feel, feel we, their way we around. repaint yes. every time, we keep the compound neat so that you, they will have that neat environment. And then the um, plumbing work takes a lot of money, um, electricity, you know, we buy diesel. For the first time, we bought two point something million of diesel because we need to keep their food you know, if you have meat mm -hmm. and uh, all this, and we have to preserve them, we have yeah. to make sure we have generator. So these are where we spend this money. Repairs, where we have cars that we have to maintain. And then, uh, in fact, the whole of last year was a very challenging task for us. Our drivers were having uh, accident and we have to repair, pay so much money. And maintenance of vehicles these days is very expensive, like our HELOCs so bad that's why the governor promised to give us hillocks but we're still waiting on him we know he's going to do it mm. i have strong belief that he's going to give us hillocks because our own is so bad mm. yeah maybe, maybe we should also appeal to let's hope innocent is also listening it's mm. nigerian made and then maybe we could why are you looking at me like that i'm just making an appeal. i'm agreeing with you <laughs> <laughs> you know but madam innocent so, your csr your csr for this year Okay. Please give a truck to the Pacelli School for the Blind. And we want to know when it happens because it will happen. Now, you, <laughs> three million every month. My math is not so good, but 
That's 12 times 3 is... Uh, 36. 36 million every year. A year. year. Wow. That How? is not money to sniff at. How do you raise that? I'm going to ask that question again. Yeah, uh, I don't... Uh, sometimes I go to Catholic Church, appeal for fund, and people will give us, they do a uh, second collection for us, mm. and then some give scholarship to our children. And sometimes we don't, uh, people just come to our door and donate something. Some where on the website we have, people will just call, sister, I have dropped something for the children. Nigerians are wonderful, as I said. Mm. People just are moved, even that during COVID. Mm. People were bringing little, little things for us to survive. Sister, so I was impressed. You, I was you, happy you, to work. You said that somebody gave scholarship. So can one just adopt a child and give that child scholarship through his, his or her years in, in, in Pacelli? Yes, many companies are doing that. Yeah, they are giving scholarship, like uh, some of the uh, Saxon company. Uh, there is one young man that started the uh, online banking. He gave scholarship to about ten children. Uzoma. So I know so many people will come. Sister, what do you want me to do? And I say, please, this child, I need scholarship for this child. I don't want them to just stop him primary six. And the uh, parents have a strong belief that. The secondary school is part of Pacelli's case. <laughs> you know, it's continuity. That if you still go there, it's still going to fall back to us. In fact, the greatest challenge I have been having in the school is the secondary school. When we, they give this scholarship, the donors, the sponsors, won't want the parents to, you know, be in charge of it. It still fall back to us. We have to monitor to make sure a child's school fees is paid and then they give us, they bring receipt for us. Are you saying, therefore, that um, your students who have proceeded to King's College and uh, Ijaneke, like you mentioned earlier, mm. um, their fees were paid by Pacelli? Yeah, the sponsors give us the money and we pay. And mm -hmm. sometimes we also step in to give scholarship. When we see it's a case, Mm -hmm. that we don't want the child to just go home like that. We pick it up until we get scholarship for the, that particular child. So a child who doesn't have scholarship and Pacelli cannot do it, what happens to that child? We make sure we do it because we don't want them to fall by the wayside. We want to make sure they move forward. Mm. Yeah, we pick it up. Mm. Yeah. You've had cases of some very brilliant children in spite of their impairment, haven't you? Yes. Are there any that you'd just like to give a shout out to? Yes, we do that. I mean, now you want to you want to talk to that person. You want to you know uh, give them a thumbs, thumbs up, up to the person now mm. that yeah, maybe the person is watching you now or someone who knows. Oh, he's hearing you. <laughs> yeah, yes. I like Victor Cherry that works with the radio. The parents could not afford it. The, the former principal, Sister uh, Asomto Kereke, went to the east and sent with one teacher, and they picked him up, and he started school. And today, he's a very big man. He, he works in the radio, Lagos Radio, and he came to say thank you to us last year. I just happened uh, to know Victor Terry because I think he's manager programs of uh, yes, a radio station. Yes, and he has been getting an award. Traffic he's, radio. Yes, yeah, traffic radio. He's blind. Yes. yes. Partially. With three no. children. No, totally blind. I know him personally. <laughs> I know him when he started broadcasting. Oh. Yeah, I've been around for a few days myself, not up to yeah. 16 Hi, years. Victor. Well, sorry, he can't hear you. <laughs> you <laughs> will see. Why? He, he, he can hear you. Yeah, he can hear me. Yeah, he can when hear. you said hi, Victor, you waved. I'm just saying. <laughs> okay. Okay. I take back my wave then. You when can his hear wife my can voice. see you. His wife <laughs> can see you. Beautiful wife he has, by the way. So, so that's just one. Yeah. And many people are, are looking at you now and saying, if only they knew how to help. If only they knew how to step in. Um, is there a website people can get go to to get information about how to reach out? To yes. Pacelli School. Uh, we have. Um, www.eg.ed 
education. Sorry, www.pacheli. Uh -huh. uh -huh. ed. 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 Uh -huh. Ed. Dot org. Dot org. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I know mm -hmm. it's Pacheli School for the Blind dot org, right? Yeah. That's yes. it. Pacheli School for the Blind, one word, yeah. dot org. Just check that now. Oh, yes. Okay. I'm on that website now and I can see quite a number of account numbers. We have and First Bank. Yes, I can see actually. There is a dollar account as well, so yeah. Oh, oh yes. okay. Yeah, very, very. <laughs> so topic. delegates, delegates, delegates. Uh, which one? If you're looking for <laughs> where to give back some of that money which you're being offered, we know you're being offered. So, if you're looking for. You have for, no proof. If you're looking for where to give back some of that money, Pacelli School for the Blind, their website has their account numbers, whether it's a Naira account you want to give into or a dollar account to make it easier for you. Which is also going around a lot. And there is also, of course, the, your phone number is also on the website, uh, yeah. Sister Jane. Yeah. Uh, so anyone who wants, quite a number of, quite some information you'll find there uh, in the list of partners and all those things are there. Okay, well, okay. that is it right there. Right, exactly. That's yeah. the website. Right. So um, let's bring in Amos. Amos. Yes, ma'am. Hmm. How are you today? I'm good, thank you, and you. I'm good. How long have you been at the Pacelli? I've been five years at Pacelli. Okay. Can you see at all? Yeah, I can see partially. Okay. So, um, do you enjoy your classes at Pacelli? Oh, I enjoy my classes very well at Pacelli because it teaches us very good. They have quality education there, and the teachers are well. They're well educated. They are. They are good. What have been your experience over the past five years at Pacelli? Uh, I've experienced good, a lot of good things at Pacelli. And from the day I entered Pacelli, after thinking that um, I've lost everything after I got blind, but oh. I thought I've, I could never be anything again. But when I got into Pacelli, I knew that yes. I could become something in the future. So I've gone for, Pajera have taken me plenty places. I've taken me like for sporting activities. And I know that, yes, I've I had good experience in Pacelli. You say when you got blind? Yes. So you were not born blind? Yes. How did you go blind? Um, at first, I think I felt sick. So I was taken to the hospital while they were giving me drip. I wanted to ease myself, then I, I could not see very well. I was seeing double. So I told my father, he, he, remo he removed the drip from my uh, hand. They took me home. All of a sudden, I could not see at all. So, so with prayers and everything, I began to regain my size much more until now. So I thought that, uh, since I've got blind already, I can't be anything. Maybe they will just abandon me. But my parents keep giving me advice and telling me that one day all will be good. So what are your hopes now? Um, having been in, in Pacelli and the things that you have experienced you know, so far, what are the things that you have learned? I mean, not just academically now. What are the things that you have learned? Maybe about life or about you know, yourself, about people? People. I've learned, about, first of all, about myself, that I could do anything I want. And about life, I've learned that, yes, life in life, you have to struggle before you become something. You have to not relax, don't relent. Keep striving out, and you be and you be what you want. And about people, most people are good, yes. But there are also some people who feel that no blindness is a disease. That when they don't like associating with the blind. So that is about people that I know. So, and oh, there are some other hmm. people that they are good. They love associating with the blind. They feel that yes, even though you are blind, no matter how you can see me, they keep encouraging us. Mm. What would you want to tell those people who are not comfortable with people who are visually impaired? I want to tell them that they should try to be, they try to adjust and be comfortable with those 
years we are blind, we are all human beings. His condition has put us in this situation. So they should not feel that if they come close to us, they will contact it. We can't contact it to our friends. <laughs> it's not infectious. <laughs> how, about, how, about, how about other you know, students like you, those who are in Pacheli and those who are not in Pacheli? What would you want to tell them if you could? Uh, first of all, those at Pacheli, I'm sure they are okay because Pacheli is like a home. They take us as if we are the children, the sisters. So they make us feel at home there. I'm sure they're comfortable there. And I would, want, I would like to tell them that they should keep striving out like me. And the people outside Pacheli that have not got, I know that there are a lot of people who want that opportunity, but because of space, they could not get that opportunity. So mm -hmm. they should not relent. They should, could, they should keep striving hard and know that one day, they will get into Pacelli or maybe mm. other some blind schools. So what do you want to do after Pacelli? Uh, after Pacelli, I wish to go to King's College. If I could get sponsors or scholarship, I wish to go to King's College. And after my school, I want to become a lawyer. Wow. Why would you want to become a lawyer in particular? I want to become a lawyer because I feel that most time people are not treated well, and people are not given justice to. So I want to stand up and become a lawyer and be that one that is going to change everything. Do you know anyone who is uh, visually impaired who is a lawyer? Yes, but I can't remember his name now. Okay. The one who was um, president of the Society for the Blind, right? Dan Lamy Bashir. Dan yes. Lamy. Yes. Dan, Dan Lamy Bashir. That's it, Bashir. He has, a, he has his own business in Lagos. He has his own company. Oh, he stopped practicing law? No, yes, a long time. Okay. He's uh, now his own. Are there challenges, hmm. Sister Jane, that you think um, you know, people who are visually impaired, whether they are in school or not, uh, challenges that they think is above or beyond them, that they, they need to be encouraged to live around? Yeah, mobility is their greatest problem. Yeah. Mobility, you know, uh, some of them are not trained and our roads are not friendly. Mm. They don't mm. consider them. Like when we take our children for mobility training, Okada people will be knocking them down and their, their guide came. So it's a big problem. Thankfully, Okada has been banned in Lagos, so let's begin from there. Yeah. <laughs> let's go on. Yeah, apart from that. I suppose that was great news to yeah. you. It's a great news because they are becoming so nuisance in the whole place. One of our outing with our children to teach them mobility, it happens. And then the, the blind people have that fear. Mm. The roads are not they don't want even. To go out. And uh, there is no pedestrian walk to say this is for pedestrian yes. walk. You just, in some of them that are very courageous who move out. The others are afraid because car could knock them down. Mm -hmm. We are not. We have not grown to that. Mm -hmm. That's the big challenge for them. I'm mixing up in the society. Sometimes when they go out, they don't want to eat because people look at them. But we try to train them how to eat mm -hmm. and how to socialize. So mm -hmm. it's a big challenge to them. Mm -hmm. What would you want to tell? people, not just Lagosians now, because we are generally restless people ourselves. What do you want to tell people generally about the, I, I really feel very, very reserved calling them blind, maybe visually impaired. It's visually impaired. Yeah. What, what do you want to tell people about them? I want to tell people that when they see them on the road, they should assist them to navigate and also to treat them very well. Because sometimes people try to avoid them. They don't feel happy that uh, people don't want to associate with them. They feel, they feel that it's contagious. It's not. Blindness is not contagious. It's hereditary sometimes, some families. So, and if we give them that hope, if we assist them, then they will feel comfortable to mix with us. Mm. Sister, do you think that as a society, we are more and more lacking in compassion and humanity? Because we shouldn't have to be told to be kind to somebody who is visually impaired. 
And I know that in the Nigeria of my youth, you didn't have to be told. You saw them trying to cross the road. You helped them. You didn't have to be told that. Anyway, some, some of us are very compassionate to them. It's few people, let me not general, just few people who do not like them. Few. So maybe these young people who do not care. But the elderly people, they try to assist where possible. Mm. I'm not just going to say Nigerians have been wonderful, I will say. Okay. But we have to create awareness. We need to have workshop okay. to educate many people. Mm -hmm. And also parents of the visually impaired. Mm -hmm. Some of them are still hiding in a corner. They are still keeping them away from the school. They don't mm. want to be identified to say, my child is visually impaired. Mm. So want to create that awareness that parents that have visually impaired children, they should bring them to us. Okay. How about young people? What, because, you know, one of the a, a critical section of society that needs to be spoken to about this are young people. Yeah. Do you think young people have enough understanding of the peculiarities that a visually impaired person has to go through? What are the things that they need to understand? How we need to tell them a little bit about the children, their psychology. Mm. And uh, some of the, uh, one school came to our school and, you know, I asked them to go and shake hands with them. They would not do that. It's not that uh, they're afraid, they don't know. But if we educate them, if they are aware that this is, this, a blind person is also a human being like every other person. I think we lack that awareness. Mm. In the whole of it's our awareness country. that is lacking, not yeah, compassion. Yeah, we lack that awareness. But as mm. for passion, they they, ha they are passionate. Seeing a blind person, some of okay. them comes to the school, they begin to cry. I'm glad to hear that our humanity has remained intact. <laughs> <sighs> so, Amos, yes, ma'am. Your final word. What do you want to say to young people out there? Um, what I want to say to young people out there is that they should try to assist us. We are blind does not mean that we are no human being. They should try to assist us and they should know that yes, there are some things that they can also gain from us. And they should try to assist us, like help us to navigate and show us the way. Like, don't take us as human beings, as your friends, as your brothers. Mm. Okay. Amos Timothy, student of the, the Pichelli School for the Blind, and if you are willing to offer any kind of help or scholarships to the children, the website to go to is www.pichelli.blind. No, Pacelli School, School for, for the Blind. blind dot dot org. E. Okay, there's no ed That's there. Uh, okay. No, I, I, you know, we some of us who are techie, we just go Google Pacelli. There he goes showing off. <laughs> <laughs> there he goes showing off. Yes. Thank you very much for coming, Sister Jane Oyeneri of the Handmaids of the Holy Child Jesus, and thank you as well to Amos Timothy, who's a student at the Pacelli. So, thank you very much, Sister. Say, yeah. I'm hoping that. Largesse will begin to pour in after this your appearance on Sunrise yes, this morning. So I will know. delegate um, um, some resources to you. Some of them. Amen to that. Amen. Okay. You see, Can I said I amen the other something? time. And you were protesting. Can I say a very big thank you? Okay. You are welcome, sister. Thank you so much All for right. inviting so Sunrise, us. we'll be right back yeah. with the home stretch. Thank you. This prophet Theophilus, the man that got caught, Tolerum flash, and then. <laughs> That's not on me. Oh my God! <laughs> That's not on me. I got nothing to do with that. Is it? It's Bukumi preacher. He's preacher. It's Bukumi preacher. That's our guest uh, this 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 morning for the home stretch. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thank you for having me again. Again, uh, for me, you know, I mean, she's having it's my first time of, of, of meeting. Uh, oh, he's been in my yeah, house. like yes, maybe since well, after I, the well. Some time ago. Mm -hmm. like did, did you pay me or that you were not around that? But I'm, I'm, I'm glad today mm -hmm. that you're amiable service. Uh, why did you? Why, why did, did it pay you? you? So, um, um, for, 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 you know, they say opposite attracts. The way you speak, uh, you your gain. carriage, and your gesticulation on TV. I'm like, hey, hello, you got to be saying, but I can speak English like this. <laughs> <laughs> You know, she's 17. Uh, yeah, of course. She, nobody it's, asked it's you. Carry. I'm just saying. Oh, something. nobody <laughs> asked you. I'm just Wait, saying. Can I finally meet you in person. I'm a boy. <laughs> you know, that's the character in Village Headmaster. Yes. The old one. And this is the male, male of it. Uh, okay. okay. Mm. 
Olubukunmi. Oluwa Bukunmi actually. <laughs> but my daddy will fight you because that name is important to my daddy. <laughs> well, keep going, go. Please. I, I promise to be normal. Let's just go. Let's just do this. Uh, Please, it's you. Uh, you promise to be normal. I try my best. Uh, okay. I, I used to be normal, but I was poor. <coughs> so, the, the day that you were born, he named you Oluwa Bukumi. God bless me. And this is what God blessed him with. See, you know that sometimes we are not careful. Nigeria can adjust your dream to size. <laughs> So Nigeria can I just dream. I would like to see, because in my father's mind, I was supposed to be a lawyer or a banker. That was the goal. Marshall. And I eventually landed in the banking industry, by the way. Um, but you know, at some point, we just discovered that. You are counting money. You, you just, I don't want to go into details of why I moved out of that um, sector. So I don't count that those money. Let me count my own money too. Um, but but you know, I tell my father, I have to be very serious in this country, very serious minded person. I woke up by six. Already I'm on the road going to work. I resume seven and I come back very late. Serious minded person with suit and tie, but I was poor. Um, is this on Well, you are counting money. Other people's money. <laughs> OPM. So, this um, seriousness is what. Um, uh, I'm, I'm really um, hoping that I'm one of people are hoping that we can get education right in this country and the system right because um, yes, I'm happy with what I do. My talent is um, helping. But I said that Nigeria is. Nigeria can ask. Adjust your dream to sight. Just ask small children that are here to meet Nigeria what they want to do when they grow up. They will say, I want to become a pilot. I said, <laughs> pilot, in which country? We don't have a plane with the whole country. We have the logo already. Uh, we we have logo. the logo, but um, we don't have the plane. I don't worry, just, just grow up. I say, I want to become a doctor. Which hospital will you work? I said, don't worry, just grow up. Nigeria will adjust the dream to size. I thought you are 25. I said, what do you do? Um, I do make up, I buy and sell, I sell on IG. By 35, so what do you do? Anything that can bring money. And have you noticed everybody has general merchandise on their, just in case one job happens, so. But really, some of us are lucky to be able to come to talent um, and um, explore. How, how did you get to that? How did you cross Leave from- banking and yes. go to- how, well, At what point did you make the, is it the discovery or the evolution? So, um, I'm, I'm blessed with um, good parenting. Um, as a young kid, my mother, you know, who is a teacher, principal now, um, took interest in giving us personal development. And I've always loved to read and, you know, and I remember that um, I think my um, second year in school, I was reading, and one of the problems I have with, um, with with that is that, okay, I can, all they are teaching me is how to serve, how to come to office, nothing about creating anything, nothing about contributing anything. I just, I, uh, so, I, I have some skills. I'm a computer person, by the way, that's why I do banking. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, I was, in, I was in bank and I noticed that all I can get is money. It's money. And um, I know that's weird for a young guy to say that, but you see, um, for me, what is core is money, passion, and time. Any job that cannot give you two of that will waste your life. Because if you have money and passion, you don't have time. If you have the time, that's where you would be. That's where your passion is. Um, if you have time and money, no passion, then you take the time and money to go and pursue your, your passion. passion. Mm. Um, the only thing I have in banking there, and I'm not, there's nothing wrong with banking, amazing people, but for me, that's not, I don't have passion there, and it's not giving me time. Um, so my passion is in entertainment. Uh, and while, uh, as a banker, there have made some friends in entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. I remember my, my colleagues used to come to our department to laugh because I'm there. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> uh, any, any end of the year, any party in the office, I'm the official MC. Um, and I've been doing this in school days, by the way. So when it was time Did they for me, pay when, when, you, when you do it for in the school, office? No, 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 no. no in the no, office. No, no, no. In the office. Office. I'm talking about Nigerian Bank. Oh. <laughs> when you know, when <laughs> you MC at their parties, yeah, for I'm, I'm, I'm reminding you that they don't pay oh, Isa, you're a good staff. It will appraise your appraisers. <laughs> oh, okay. No, no. They write you a letter of commendation. Oh, I promise you, no. Know, I, I didn't get any. But it was good. See, I think the problem that we have now is that the, 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 Young people don't understand the place of someone using you. And I want to use that word play because that's what they say. You are using me. I say, let them use you. Because now they use me. The, the platforms that they gave me then, use I would not have been able to expose you. Expose me. I would, I would make my mistakes. I would learn. I would serve. So at some point, I would move. You can't use me forever. 
Mm. But let me, let me <laughs> ask you a question. Um, I know the last time, the first time this man was here, he was a boy. Would I'll tell you what I not? mean. Wait, wait. He was not married then. Now he is married. Muti Loli Oko, as in... Muti Loli Oko. I went to... The wife came to my house. There was a movement, yeah? Somebody... Oko, 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 Detach and go to his wife. No, 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 no. I detached his no, night. So I detached from my parents in Stolzon and I when I moved to Lego. I've been detached for a long time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh -huh. I just moved down close. Uh, so. <laughs> Don't look at me. Look at him. <laughs> okay, yes. He will leave and cling to his wife. And cling his to his wife. wife. Yes. I cling. Oh, okay. You so left you his moved father. and clung to your wife. Yeah, I moved and clung to my wife. Although the things are very much, I, I can't balance, but I like uh, it. It's okay. Really? Mm. How? You know, marriage is the only place where somebody makes, you make the money. Somebody spends it and you get the alert. <laughs> I come here and I say, mm, my wife is buying something. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm married from the Delta Igbo side of the country. Beautiful so there are her people? You're my hero. Good girl. You are the best. <laughs> Good girl. Good girl. You are the upper people. So if you don't want to look after your wife, mm -hmm. what did you marry her for? Well, like I said, you know, I said say it affecting my balance, but I'm not complaining. That's what Please I don't complain. Mm, I'm not but really, beautiful people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. The Lord helping us. Yeah, hey, I, know. I let, know. Let's talk about your brands. Okay. This Bukumi preacher has spiraled into a few. Yes. Um, one of it is this Prophet Theophilus that was yes, Prophet looking Theophilus, for that was something that was missing. Mm -hmm. Tell us about him. Prophet Theophilus um, came out of my experience. I, I, my, my apologies. I asked that because not every comedian creates. Uh, persona. About, persona. Four of them. Oh, personas. Mm. Okay. You have about have four, of, four them. of them. Okay. Mm. I have Prophet Tuflos, like you know. Okay. Um, I have an Afa that speaks Arabic and all of that. Like, how, um, how does he say that? Um, I have. Um, I have. You will give us each of them. I have Aliberi. Okay. I have Aliberi, the one that speaks Yoruba, entirely Yoruba. Um, so what yes. happens is, uh, um, and he, and then he's which called is the Aliberi. Which is the fourth it's one? It's called Aliberi. So the fourth one is the me that goes on to that act. I, okay. I, I did something out. That's the Bukumi preacher. That's the Bukumi preacher. So, okay. but tell us about... Theophilus. Wait, wait. We'll come to <laughs> Theophilus. Give us a sample of Halle Berry. Halle Berry, Halle Berry, oh. Sherry, Halle Berry advice the man give. Okay. You know, for, instance. Wanna, for instance. For instance. Ah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Sherry, or Halle Berry, Uli. Okay, Halle Berry, wait. I want to bring you a good advice. I'll call it over film, only to Fura. Because, tell the Bafa Bubin Jadimania, a Jacabo on the swimming, to the make of Burkuna Manchilico anymore, be interfere cola, to the three make of cover. But swimming go, I felt him by to make cop, and to what I know she needs in Lico. So, the Bafa Bubin Jadimania, but the Jadimania. Okay, how about the Afa? Okay, the Afa, the Afa is, um, the, the Afa does a lot of uh, mimicking. Mm -hmm. um, I deal with directly with social. Uh, so I discovered that I have a lot of uh, Muslim in my followers, and um, I, I personally enjoy some Muslim um, preachers myself. Uh, I follow them myself. Uh, do you speak Arabic? I, I, I don't speak in the sense of it, so that I don't. I, I have enough in uh, in my pocket to make what I want to do. But uh, because the, the I, like every Yor most Yoruba people, my grandfather is a Muslim. Okay, mm -hmm. so, right. I'm, so I'm privileged to. I think Said is my Muslim name. You I was think? told. My father told me. So. My father is a pastor. You will not want to agree <laughs> with my Muslim name. <laughs> so, I but hope he's watching. I found it myself. I, let's hope he's not. Because he said, you're a Muslim member. You are a Christian shite. <laughs> but but tell, tell us about this affair. What does he do? Give us a sample of his character. A sample of his character would probably be in him in one big regalia, Agbada. And he's telling people, and he speaks in Yoruba with subtitles, and he said, well, Oh, was that him at the, 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 the last... Uh, no, that's, so that's, that's Prophet. That's prophet oh, that's so. Okay. The Abadas are different. Um, oh. The followers uh, understand him. He speaks something about... Uh, so some of those, the way <laughs> Afa speaks, and, and he tells them, and I uh, remember the last one I did was that, i about block where you block, I'm block where Facebook block you. I'm about to block where you block you. I'm about to So... <laughs> <laughs> so it just tried to, um, you know, bring some of this. And 
for me, the two characters, especially Ali Berry and Afar, I, I try to use them to speak to mm. the society vice, the things that I, I think are wrong, um, like, um, you know, swindling people. You know, but this is Prophet Theophilus. This is Prophet Theophilus. Which one is mission conspiracy these, again? Um, this, I, I can't explain this particular skit on TV. Um, because I can't explain it. But if you see his hand, you should know its location. It's, like, um, <laughs> it's, like, it's very close to a toll gate, but let's just move. <laughs> it was when something was discovered. Um, it, 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 you know, the, the, what, what we do as comedians is to, um, what is happening in society, bring it to you, find the comedy part of put our message there, but make sure that you're putting the comedy. You know, after so this, this, this is the conspiracy. Yes, this is the this, this, this the old compound was overnight. They cleaned the compound, they cleared the opening, like they cleared some place, and you came back after some few days to discover another thing. Like, in the same place, like he's trying to discover, and he's telling them that ah, I don't move, my body is more. Telling them that you are doing something here. <laughs> Mm. So this is Prophet Evilus. Now Prophet Evilus now discovered condom. Um, in in, in, in church. Back, back, backyard. That, 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 as a Prophet Evilus reloaded, that was when we featured Ted Baby Face um, and all of that. Um, it's, it's a full series now. Oh, okay. um, this, this is uh, um, arrangements. Mm. arrangements. Because condom is waiting there now. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm not a comedian. <coughs> <coughs> okay, yes, so... Yes, you have a project coming up. Yes. Or the project, uh, project you're working on now. Yes, that is the Prophet Theophilus um, series. series. Okay. And, uh, and another one called Ride With Me. Um, so what I've done is to take away the interviews from the studios into a car. So we have a car, um, you know, leading with about five cameras in and outside the cars. So we drive around and um we just just we just just so I have celebrities I have influencers um ride with me i call it ride with me oh, okay. what's the objective so the objective is to so what i'm doing on the show basically is to go beyond the so how did you start mm. uh, so when did you start so I, it's to meet the person mm. um we, we're driving there was a particular day we're driving and um someone eat our car and um, my guests react as a normal Nigerian. I want you to come on the <laughs> show. Natural. And, and, and be and, yourself. And, uh, okay. And, um, we, we are wrapping up okay. in about two minutes or less. Okay. Nigeria is on the march again. And I know you happen to be passionate about Nigeria. Please don't throw your punches here. Mm -hmm. But there are people who would want to, you know, vote for somebody or other. The word I use is employ a new set of people. Mm -hmm. In terms of employing new people to govern us mm -hmm. at various levels of the nation, um, do you see a role for comedians in helping to shape the minds of both the delegates that are going to select candidates mm -hmm. and the people who will vote for the candidates of their choice? Of course, we are back on their stage now. We are back on stage. You can see comedians on the rallies already. Um, some for governance reasons, some for personal pocket reasons. Pecuniary. Uh, um, so, um, but you cannot blame people. Um, every comedian, every celebrity, has, they have the right to choose mm -hmm. who to follow or who to campaign for. Um, I'm just begging that we put Nigeria first. Uh, because once you select these people, we are going on another eight years run. Um, so, I, and I know that people just, let me just collect my own share and move. But you see, um, I, I love Nigeria so much. And, um, but unfortunately, I'm still scanning these options that we have. I can't see it personally now. But what I'm saying is that for comedians, we have a role to play. Because you see, people might not remember the last message in, that their pastor preached or that they are far mm. um, the sermon. But they will remember the last joke that you made. Mm. They follow the jokes, they talk to you. So please, Put the message there, and I'm very glad with some what some of my colleagues did over two years now, shouting for the PVC. Mm. 
We are shouting, we are begging, because we need to beg now. <laughs> Go and get your PVCs. Mm. That is the, don't, don't let anyone tell you that your vote does not count. If it doesn't count, they will not rig. So please, let's get the PVCs and vote. So uh, I'm hoping that comedians would use their influence, because it's big. OK. Mm. Um, what, what, what's your, quickly, what's your uh, social media handle? Just so those, those um, who want Bukumi to. Preacher, at Bukumi Preacher. That's B-U-K-U-N-M-I. Preacher. P R E A C. Don't worry. If they, if they, they, if, they, if, they, if they if they spell it wrong, Google will come. Hey, yeah, Google will come. It's come up. It's come up. It's come we up. have to thank you very much thank for being here this morning. Mm -hmm. Bukumi Adelani, popularly known as Bukumi Preacher, as you have heard, has been our guest this morning. He's a comedian, author, and television host. Thank you so much for being here today. And Bukumi closes the show for today. It's been our pleasure bringing you this edition. We'll be here to bring you another one next week. I'm Alero Edu, wishing you a happy weekend and a blessed week ahead. I'm Ayo Makinde. Have a wonderful weekend and see you next week. Bye.